Three minutes after ten is the time, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. What? What was? The, I can't do this. This isn't a phone-in. Good lord! I mean, things are bad, but they're not that bad. Um, but, but did you have a night? What was your best Easter egg? Do people still do? People still do Easter eggs, don't they? We. I had an Easter egg this Easter that was, by some distance, the least disappointing Easter egg I've had in probably twenty years. I, I, it was an absolute joy. It's, I, goodness knows why it's taken so long to happen upon one that reached the parts that other Easter eggs cannot reach. But goodness me, it's quite delightful. Um, why was I talking about being smelly in that little introduction that you may have heard 15 minutes or so before the end of Nick's show? The answer is that the Conservative government is uh, facing a bit of a, a brouhaha about homelessness. Um, with elements of the party wanting to criminalise it still further. It's what you might call a hangover from the Suella Braverman regime at the Home Office. And then some uh, rather more humanitarian Conservative MPs who are keen to throw out the criminalisation of any elements of homelessness altogether. Yet more evidence, really, that that increasingly the Tories are not a political party in any meaningful sense. So, so fractured and indeed fractious is the conglomeration of parliamentarians all gathering under the same umbrella, that it's, um, it, it, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint precisely what they stand for or who speaks most for them. Um, but I don't want to start with that today. And, and, of course, we may get on to this new law in Scotland, the Hate Crime Act, which seems to be destined to cause immense amounts of confusion and quite possibly political difficulty for, uh, for the Scottish government, not least because J.K. Rowling has brought her not inconsiderable heft and public profile to the table in a rather arresting fashion, if you pardon the pun. But, but with, and, of course, um, events in the Middle East, again, uh, causing grave concern uh, with seven aid workers apparently killed during an Israeli attack in Gaza. More details on that as they emerge in the course of the programme and, indeed, more details on the, um, uh, the, the well, horrific state of the Al-Shifa hospital from which the Israelis have finally withdrawn. Some of the footage emerging there just beggars belief. So there's some uh, uh, stories that are uh, in front of us today, but I want to begin with a completely, um, what would the one be, Un untraumatic story. I want to begin with quite a gentle story, ease ourselves back into the conversation this week. How long have you been listening to this radio? So how long have you been engaged in sort of public debates? The, um, the, the, the kind of classic debating topics. Did you do it at school? Did you do debating at school? Did you, what were the big things at school? Abortion. I went to a Catholic school, so abortion was huge. And, and bearing in mind, I'm in my early 50s. So we're talking about the 1980s. Uh, what, what, what are the top 10 topics now? for debates in schools and colleges. I, I hope they still do debates in schools and colleges, give you incredible skills that are useful in the future. So you had the death penalty. That's gone away, hasn't it, really? Although I wouldn't say forever. I, I'm sure that some um, 30p Lee type character will be bringing or trying to bring it back into public discourse at, at some point in the not dis too distant future. So you had the death penalty, you had abortion. I, I think I probably would have said to you five years ago, that one was done and dusted, but then, of course, Donald Trump happened. And uh, and the uh, repeal of, of Roe versus Wade reminded us all that nothing is permanent. Fox hunting was huge, probably, maybe because I went to quite a posh school. So abortion because I went to a Catholic school and fox hunting because I went to a posh school. But fox hunting wasn't just confined to posh schools. Otherwise, Tony Blair's first administration wouldn't have... Um, wouldn't have banned it, would they? It was obviously something that, that resonated far beyond posh schools. So what have we got? Abortion, death penalty, fox hunting. What else would you put on that list? What are the hardiest... Royal family? House of Lords? Put them in one, shall we? They go in one envelope. Royal family, House of Lords. Uh, shall we abolish those? Labour this weekend. I genu what story this weekend did you think was an April Fool and then it turned out not to be? It was April Fool's Day yesterday. What, what, was there a story this weekend that you thought that, well, yesterday before noon, because if it's afternoon, it doesn't count. Was there a story that you thought was an April Fool and it turned out not to be an April Fool? And it has to be within that window. It can't be the fellow that did an anti-Nike boycott speech while wearing Nike trainers. That happened a few days previously. So was there a little... The one for me was um, the Labour Party planning to abolish hereditary peers quite quickly after coming into power. But that wasn't it, because then you'd think, yeah, that seems quite reasonable. It's a bit odd to put it out on April the 1st. 
but they'll be allowed to continue to use the bars and the restaurants. And for some reason, I thought that second bit of the story made it sound a little bit suspicious. I thought they're going to abolish hereditary pits, but you can still use the subsidised bars and restaurants. I thought it's not the best April Fool I've ever seen in my life, but, I, I mean, it's quite funny. Turns out it was completely true. That is what Labour sources told newspapers over the weekend, that they're going to do away. So hereditary peers would have been on the list. So what have we got now? We've got abortion, we've got fox hunting, we've got the death penalty, and we've got the House of Lords stroke the royal family. I should rephrase that. The House of Lords and or the royal family. So so there's four stroke five topics for discussion. What else? What else? What else? Come on. You can do better than this. What else would have been on the list? Like the classic sixth form debating society topics. What else would you have had there? I, I don't know. I think actually we've probably come close to the top five. Four if you uh, elide the royal family with the House of Lords. And then number five would be cannabis. Should we legalise cannabis? That has been a hardy, a hardy perennial of political debate for as long as I have been alive. And what is fascinating about it is the swinging of the pendulum, the way in which the public attitude towards it has changed beyond recognition in the course of, let's say, the 40 years since I was 12. Uh, and I know a little bit about this because my life was almost turned upside down as a consequence. Well, it was turned briefly upside down as a consequence of, oh, private schools, Karen, well played. Yes, of course. Pri- well, that's coming back round again, isn't it, with the abolition of um, VAT exemptions for private schools and the discovery of people on the right who don't believe in poverty when it actually involves poor people, but do believe in poverty when it involves parents who may struggle to find the extra quids they need to pay school fees. For them, we bring, break out the violins, remember? For people who are struggling to feed their children, we break out contempt and condescension and comments about 30p meals. So that would get on the list as well. I should have written this down. We're up to six now. Uh, it's the first show of the week, so my memory should be up to holding six thoughts in it simultaneously. So, so the, the, the cannabis conversation for me was always very personal. If you listened to this program 10 years ago, you'd have noted perhaps that we talked about it all the time because I managed to get myself thrown out of boarding school for, for involvement in uh, cannabis consumption. And that was quite a big deal in 1990. Would you believe that it made the 10 o'clock news? It was even on Capital Radio. My sister heard it on Capital Radio, which means that it was in, well, it was in this building, wasn't it? Was it not in this building 40 years ago? Oh, what a shame. Anyway, kind of metaphorically speaking, it was in this building where they they didn't name us. We were children, but they announced such was the prestige of the school that they announced the expulsion of four boys for um, cannabis. They announced it on the national news. And it it wasn't great. I'm not going to lie to you. And a lot of my attitude towards legalization and criminalization of cannabis was informed for many years by the profound and very personal belief that you shouldn't ruin a young man's life or a young woman's life for something relatively innocuous as smoking a herb, as I I believe it's still called in some quarters. And the difference between what would happen to someone like me with my background and what might happen to someone who was caught in possession as a consequence of a, of, a, of a random stop and search in South London. The differences were extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And, and that informed me. So a lot of the time when I was quite a passionate legalization advocate, a lot of the time I was talking about uh, an avoidance of consequence for, because, you know, what would you rather have as a parent? Would you rather have an 18 year old who is getting stoned quite often or an 18 year old who's getting very drunk quite often? And I, I think most people would probably go with, go with stoned. And then as I got older, and, and I'm familiar with the conversations about the, the, the changing strains and how skunk is a very different proposition from the sort of uh, the strains that were smoked in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even the 90s. And, and the, the, the pervasive tang uh, of the stuff that you can't really walk through any built up area anymore without, without smelling it. And, and my attitude began to shift ever so slightly in so far as my friends who never knocked it on the head were measurably less productive than my friends who did, or or, or indeed the ones who never started. But such a tiny number of people go down a sort of cul-de-sac 
of inactivity or a cul-de-sac of lethargy that I didn't know how pertinent it was. And then, much to my own surprise, everybody started legalising it. I, I would have thought we'd be quite near the front of the queue once. It, I, I would have to go back to sort of 1990, 1991, Amsterdam, for my first flavour of what a decriminalised environment was like. And it was simultaneously fantastic and unpleasant. So you could go into a coffee shop, buy from a menu a selection of, uh, 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 of weed, and even with descriptions like a wine list, you know, so top notes of, of, of Blackberry or something like that, or this one will make you see stars, and they had amazing names. And it was, you know, if you'd been brought up in this country where you had to sort of go and stand in a pub toilet for 20 minutes hoping that someone would turn up and sell you a lump of licorice, it was, it was a revelatory experience. But it was also quite unpleasant in that the areas... Uh, in central Amsterdam, were uh, full of other types of drugs. You couldn't walk anywhere without people trying to sell you all sorts of stuff. And, and they've cleaned that up now. Amsterdam is completely different. But I've not got a, um, I've not got a handle on what has happened in all the places where they have legalised it. And it occurred to me this morning, as Germany became the latest country, the biggest EU country so far, to legalise recreational cannabis, it occurred to me that we've not caught up with the times. We, we've still had a few debates about whether or not this or whether or not that, and we have the mental health conversation, which is important, but not one that we're going to have today, I don't think. We haven't actually had a simple conversation about what it's like when it happens. So there are several states in America now. Um, there are a, a, an increasing number of European countries, including as of today, as of yesterday, Germany. I tell you what, if this is an April Fool's, it's absolutely brilliant. It's got halfway around the world before the truth has got its trousers on. But I'm fairly confident it's not. You can have anyone over the age of 18 can have 50 grams at home. You can smoke it in public as long as you're 100 metres away from schools, playgrounds and sports centres and not in the immediate proximity of minors. You can carry 25 grams on the streets. It will be distributed via cannabis clubs, which will have a maximum of 500 members. It sounds, I would have thought, it sounds quite German, actually. It sounds quite um, well-regulated and quite efficient, Vorsprung durch Technik. But I have no idea of what, what the impact has been in places that have already done it. So Malta, Luxembourg have done it. Other countries, Portugal, I know, has um, moved in, in, in a similar direction. Various American states have done it. And I think today I want to do two things. I want you to tell me what it's like where you are, where they did it. OK, well, what changed? Maybe nothing changed. Uh, maybe it is a kind of massive anti-climax in that nobody who wasn't already interested in consuming it suddenly becomes interested in consuming it. And all you've done is, is, is sort of remove the sleaze, the level of sleaze and criminality from the process, which should really be good news for everybody, shouldn't it? So what, what actually happened when they did it where you are? 0345 6060973. -60 and the second question is, and I want you to think about this quite carefully. If they did it here at midnight tonight, right? Think about this. This is important. If they did it here in the United Kingdom at midnight tonight, what would tomorrow be like? What would be different? I, I mean, for example, I imagine it would probably not take long before the vested interests that have moved from tobacco to vaping and, and sort of sustained their imperial status, they would move in pretty quickly on this. Yeah, you, you, I don't think you'd have, you know, doughty young mavericks moving into the cannabis space and, and, and making a fortune. I think it would probably be fairly quickly monopolized by precisely the interests that have already monopolized um, arguably less healthy pastimes. But, I, but I don't, I'm thinking out loud. I just want to know. I want to know what would happen here. What would happen overnight if they legalized it here what would change so in some ways they are that's good from james vorsprung dork dork no it's vorsprung dork sputnik that's a joke because sputnik i believe is a variety of cannabis that's quite good well done james i wish i'd come out that with myself um what would change so in, in a way it's the same question what did change where you are but coming at it from this angle from this how would your life change if it became 
legal if it became decriminalized. Uh, Tom's got in touch early saying, James, it would be brilliant. I'm looking for a little more than that, Tom. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm looking for a little bit more by way of detail and speculation. 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. And yes, as uh, another James, everyone's called James today, has pointed out, it is yet more evidence that EU countries can indeed change and introduce laws entirely independently of other European Union countries. Well, frankly, who knew? Uh, so there you go. That, that, those are your two questions. What, what, what was it like? What was it like in the place where you lived or, or spent a lot of time that had legalised cannabis? And what would happen if we followed the German example and did it here tomorrow? 10.21 is the time. This isn't the central point of the conversation today, but Lee's been in touch to say, I think that these kind of debates really were only for posh schools, James. I went to a state school and would have loved to have done debating. It would have given me a skill that I didn't acquire until much later in life. It's a really good example of how that kind of education gives you a leg up, mate. I've been listening to you for 15 years. How to make a fella feel old, Lee. 15 years. Man and boy. Um... But it is one of the hardy perennials of conversation. And yet in recent years, it's, 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 it's died down partly, I think, because it's getting legalized everywhere. But what happens when that happens? Mark is in Groningen in the Netherlands. Mark, perfect start. What, what can you tell us? Hi, uh, it's my second call, James. I called you before Christmas uh, to talk about euthanasia, I think. Oh, well, that, well, well, that could almost be on the list of, of classic <laughs> debating topics as well. But you don't, you don't have to sure keep to. count, Mark. You're part of the family now. What, what would no, you like to say? So becoming your resident Dutch correspondent. That'll do. Um, I just uh, was thinking, you were talking about Amsterdam. And um, in my city here, Groningen, which is a city of about 200,000 people, I think we've got uh, five or six coffee shops. And most of them are extremely pleasant uh, very luxurious. Uh, the rules are very strict. Um, you're you can't. You're not supposed to smoke cannabis on the street, although people do, and the police ignore it. Yes, same here actually, and it's not. It's not in any way legalised here. No. Um, the point is that uh, when you look at the people who go into coffee shops, um, they're not what you would imagine sort of drug takers to be. It's a whole range of people. Yes. I've I've used it occasionally. Um, one, the point I made to your um, researcher was it's going to be interesting because certainly at the weekends and in the summer, a lot of the people who use coffee shops here in Kronium are young Germans who have come over the border to buy, to stock up with their joints and everything yes. and, and take them back. So if they don't have to do it now, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what effect that has on the on the coffee shop. So, so you're, you're, you're suggesting it doesn't, it, it's not feeding a massive domestic appetite at the moment. It, it, it's, it's, it's a sort of relatively low level commercial operation. Yeah, I, I know very few people who, who, uh, who regularly smoke joints. Some people like me, very occasionally I'll get one. Mm. Uh, they're, they're not cheap, to be honest. It's they, how much euros. are they? Four euros four for one. Four euros for one joint. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the interesting thing here is it's technically illegal to grow cannabis. So you occasionally get reports of police raiding um, uh, cannabis plantations, which makes it weird. You yes. can sell it, but you can't grow it. Um, and so, is, there, is, there, is there still an underground market as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Why? Why? Yeah, because it's yeah. so expensive? Or, or, or I mean, so you, can, so you can buy it legally, but people still buy it illegally. Is that, have I got that right I, or not? think so but it's more that there's a uh, there's still a drug problem with everything else all the I other mean, drugs it, it, yes. it's fairly limited what you can buy in coffee shops it's not that you can go in and no, no, no. you know inject yourself with heroin or anything so i mean you you do get a lot of uh, drug dealing on the street it's not that it's a, a, a cure-all but it's i think it's doing something reasonable I, I as you say when it started in amsterdam it was pretty horrible yes it was um it's yeah, completely. So, 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 yeah, but so, so what it does is take this because I always found that odd growing up, and 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 you know, there were two sides of the same coin. There were young people who couldn't quite understand why it was lumped in with with hard drugs uh, uh, in terms of police involvement and the trouble you could get into. But then, of course, the older generation didn't really stop to make the distinction. So. I, I think for my late father, finding out that I had smoked cannabis was equivalent to finding out that I'd smoked heroin. In his mind, it was, you know, that, that, that the criminal drug was the thing. And that's obviously a bit silly. And, and that's what the 
Dutch model addresses. Thank you, Mark. Michael's in Southampton. Michael, what would you like to say? Um, how are you doing, James? Right? First Welcome. time caller. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Um, well, I work in the industry, so I do have quite a sort of envious job. Envious job. I'm a I'm a contractor, basically. I work as a sales director for a dry herb vaporizer company. So, I mean, these products, you can put anything you want in them. You can put CBD in them, which is obviously, you know, a lot more legal in a lot more places than THC cannabis. Yes. Um, but, yeah, I've sort of spent, you know, I've worked for a couple of these um, big American companies. I've spent the sort of last five years in the industry and I've been all around the U.S. and I've been all around Germany in the last few years. Well, where do you today. sell? You don't sell. Spain. Well, where do you sell? We sell the product everywhere. We sell the product everywhere. And obviously so, the regulations are different. Different. I mean, in some places. So you sell, a, you sell a product that is essentially exactly. designed for the consumption of, of cannabis, but you can, of course, yep. sell it anywhere because. Yeah. It's an, it's an RM therapy product, and it's, right. it's designed for, for healthier consumption of any botanical. So it's a vaporizer. Exactly, yeah. And we're shying away from that term now because Why? of the nicotine vaporizer products okay. are being tarnished yeah. with such bad things. So this is, you know, we're sort of, the technical term is a thermal extraction device, but it's it, you, you sort of, you heat up your botanical instead of burning it. Yes. Okay, so this is much healthier now. You can now buy these dry herb vaporizers on the NHS as part of your Brit- British medical consumption. There's not so, a lot. There's not a lot of that going on, but there. Are, I mean, there is some of it. So, what what do you notice in the territories when legalisation happens or decriminalisation? Well, so, as I said to your colleague, it's yeah. really interesting. I think you get this. You get this bump in, in in America because we've got all of the data, right? Everybody's tracking everything in America. All yes. of the statistics are out there. So, when it becomes legal, you sort of you've got two phases. You've got the decriminalisation, which you're seeing in places in Europe at the moment, which is different because then you're just not getting arrested for something that you're growing at home or buying from your buddy. Yeah. Then you go to the legalization yeah. where we are in America. I mean, you can go to Las Vegas. It's like MedMen's like an Apple shop, right? You've got iPads. You've got little infographics as to what this does. You've got gummies. You've got concentrates. It, you've got all it, of these crazy things. How, how does a state line... I'm sorry. I, I, you're probably too young to remember the Dukes of Hazard. but how do state well, lines... We're similar, we're similar age. We're similar age. Oh, yeah, are we? Yeah, so you remember yeah. two, two, two modern-day Robin Hood. Yeah. How, what happens yeah. at state lines if one state has legalized it and another state hasn't? Surely does that... Yeah. Honestly, this is the, this is the most interesting thing. Yes. You can go to you can go in your car from Las Vegas, where you'll probably get a slap on the wrist, right. and that touches on what you said before. If you're a white guy in a nice car in America yeah. and you get caught in Las Vegas, it's going to be very different to if you're a black guy. And I've seen that in, in Vegas, you know, and that, that's in America. That's prevalent. That's a different thing. Sure. But you're a white guy in that car and you've got a little vape pen or you've got a little few spliffs or whatever it is in, in your vehicle, and you cross that state line to Utah then you're going from a slap of the wrist to potentially six years in prison That's incredible, like, isn't it? Uh, That's uh, been, yeah. over, over, over a border. But the interesting thing for me is this, you know, Go the on. black market in America has stayed because the tax take is so high, okay? So you think about 50% additional cost that's just for the state taxes, okay? So yes. your, your 40 pounds here becomes 80 all of a sudden. Right. So you get this bump where it's exciting for the traditional black market consumer today will go to these elaborate stores and get these big brand names and pay the double price. But that fades out. So that black market customer still goes to his buddy because he's getting it half the price, okay? Right. What happens is this different type of consumer comes out. So the people that are probably like our age, that when you were 20, you didn't mind going to the pub toilet to, to, to buy a bag of weed. No. But when you're, when you're 40 or, or 45, you don't want to do that. You've got kids. Da, 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 yeah. da, da, da. But then you, if you can go down the shop and it's like, okay, this is, you know, this is just like going to buy, buy alcohol. And that is exactly what it is. So, you know, I, I say to all of my friends and family when I got into this industry, the way to look at it is, is, is two things. You're either replacing somebody going to a bottle shop and getting some, some drinks on yeah. the evening, yeah. or you're replacing somebody going to a pharmacy and getting some kind of medication for some kind of ailment. What, what, what about the mythical... What, what, we're quite short of time. So what, what about the idea <laughs> I've got somewhere <laughs> bubbling away in the back of my mind that if I... If I still worked in a shop or something, uh, and yeah. I, I, then the temptation of just being high all day might be quite high. Would that would that not? Does that happen at all? I think it does. With, with the edibles and the gummies and, and people yeah, just consuming yeah. it in lots of different ways and sort of spending their whole life on a on a gentle. 
Up Listen, if you, were, if, you're, if, if, you were, if you work in a pub and you yeah. go to the pub and you start drinking at 11 o'clock when your shift starts, that job isn't going to last long and your career is not going to last long in the pub industry. So you've got to look at it like that. You know, these, it's you, not you like know, that, though, is it? it, it? It's, it's a little bit different because yeah. some people can function. And you can you know, sustain a general day. level rather than a, you know, alcohol is a gradient. And once you're on it, you, you, you can't yeah, really yeah. hit an even key. I think key. it is a bit of a myth where you see that you think that everybody that's smoking weed is just sitting at home and can't get off the sofa <laughs> and is eating crisps and playing computer <laughs> games. I, I, te- I tell you, I've seen some guys in America that are highly, you know, act- highly productive. Uh, mergers and acquisitions yeah. for you know, hundred million dollar companies and they're just high all day. So that, you know, it is, that is a little bit of a mess, I think. So, I know. like it. No, Michael, perfect call. Well, two perfect calls, one from an area where it's legal and, and, and someone from the heart of the industry that's growing up around it. I'm struck by how many people are getting in touch with me. And listen, the plural of anecdote is never going to be data, but I am struck by how many people are getting in touch to say that they do actually have prescriptions in this country, that they, that they do have little difficulty in accessing uh, medicinal cannabis uh, officially and, and formally. I don't know what the numbers are on that. I don't know if anyone's, anyone's checked. It is, however, 10.32 now, and Thomas Watts is here with your headlines. 25 minutes to 11 is the time. You, you know when you sort of sometimes fall into the trap of thinking, oh, nothing ever changes. It doesn't matter what you do. It's so not true, you know. It's just that things generally happen quite incrementally. A, a big legislative change like the one in Germany overnight feels huge. But I wonder if it is, actually. If you think about, well, I don't know where you live, but certainly in London and in Manchester and in Birmingham, I, I, I have the pleasure of, I've had the pleasure of visiting many, many cities in the last six months or so because I've been um, touring my book. And the, the change in our society, if cannabis was suddenly legalised, I think would be quite small. It would simply be that people who currently consume it would be able to do so a little bit more easily. Uh, they'd be able to buy it a little bit more easily, possibly a little bit more expensively, but but more easily. And apart from that, I mean, how? I mean, do people still get arrested for... I, I can't, it's very hard to believe that many people get arrested for it when the when I, my children were about seven, I think, when they started recognising the smell, or at least saying, Daddy, what's that smell? It was like a different smell from, from anything else that they might have encountered, just as we were walking around Chiswick, one of the leafiest... So the very sort of mothership of leafy West London suburbs. So I don't. So so I'm not sure it would be that that huge a change. But 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 I don't know. I'm not inviting calls or indeed contributions from people who spend their lives mildly stoned. I was just a concern of mine that legalisation might seem might lead to people living their lives in a in a sort of in in, in third gear or second gear and never really reaching fourth or fifth. But I'm, I'm getting them. Uh, I'm a software developer. I'd rather not give my name for obvious reasons, but I spend most of every day mildly stoned. I'm very non-neurotypical, and I found whilst revising at university that it hugely helps my focus. I managed to zone in, as it were, and it also helps me with insomnia. So I go to work, I attend meetings, I discuss new and innovative ways of upgrading the UK's smart metering network, and I do all of it to use your phrase, just a little bit stoned. It helps me concentrate when I uh, need to write code as well. William is in Portland, Oregon. William, what can you tell us? Uh, yeah, James, you made me chuckle there when you mentioned the lump of licorice from your younger years. That's, uh. that's how I remember my youth in Glasgow, hunting around looking for that little lump of licorice. Yes. Uh, since then... Uh, I've moved to Portland, Oregon, and it's completely legal over here, and I can get whatever marijuana product I want. And what what sort of products are there? Because again, I, I'm a complete uh, ignoramus on this. So you you can buy sweets, biscuits, all sorts of things. Yeah, you go into the the dispensaries are called, and you can get the regular flower, the marijuana, the plant, you know, that you get normally. And there's a variety, is there? That you, there's a, like a menu, or there's is it just one type? Yeah, there's a whole bunch. There's two different types, different sativa or indica, or different grades or different prices in terms of premium and what grade the, the, the flower is. And then you have edibles, and then you have topicals that are for a lot of people that might have some pain, pain relief and stuff like that. Okay, yeah. You can really get anything. It's like a candy store for people that smoke pot, really. And how, and how 
I was interested that in Groningen there, there were only five or six for a population of 200,000. Are they on every high street or, or do you have to make a bit of a journey to get to one? I'm interested in using that to somehow measure demand. I, mean, I presume it's not like they're not queuing around the block, for example. It's, it's not like when a new no. set of trainers are released and I accidentally wander into Soho and wonder what the heck is going on. You know that way when you go into like Google Maps or Apple yeah. Maps or any maps and you, you type in... Starbucks, yes. and you see on the map it shows up how many is close to where you are. When I do that for where I am, there's about five Starbucks and there's about five McDonald's. There's about eighteen or nineteen dispensaries. Oh, okay. So that's so, my question yeah. answered. So they're doing some business then. Yeah, they're doing some business because uh, it's like you said earlier. You you were wanting to know what has changed since yes. it's uh, become an actual thing. You know, a fully fledged operation, taxed and everything. And I think big business is in operation now because you're starting to see products become inferior than it was when dispensaries peaked and everybody was like excited about it. Right. And I think now that big business is involved, you're you're seeing conglomerates of dispensaries like get together and push certain products that maybe they're affiliated to and yeah. I don't know, it makes me go back to actually either growing the free legal plants that I can legally grow in my garage or buying it from somebody else. Oh, really? So so that's, mm. I, I suppose, prioritisation of profit, is it, that we're describing? It's, it's when, when the bigger businesses move in, they're looking solely at shareholder dividends and, and profit margins rather than, t- it's a bit like brewing ale, I suppose, rather than taking enormous pleasure yeah. in, in, in producing the finest product they can, that the priorities change. But the guy before that you spoke to, he yeah. said that... Uh, you were taxed at were taxed at fifty percent, but it's only seventeen percent. And I mean, one of the good things is that the seventeen percent of that seventeen percent, forty percent is for state school funds. Oh, really? Twenty percent is for Oregon Health Authority. Fifteen um, percent is for state police, and then is broken down then for local amenities. And then there's a three percent local tax put on top for the dispensaries to actually put back into the area that they're directly affecting. Oh, that's, I like that kind um, of transparency. Or, it's a, it's a sp- specific to that tax. And how has it, I mean, I mean when you say you, you either grow your own or get it somewhere else, you mean you go back to the illegal market? Well, um, I guess, yeah, it would be illegal if you're buying it from somebody else growing it. It oh, I see. So you're not. No, so you're not going to. You're not hanging around in the back room of the dog and duck, waiting for someone to turn up with a. You, you, you're just dealing with fellow growers, as it were, fellow enthusiasts. Yeah. So, 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 how yeah, big is the black like, market? How big is the illegal? So is the illegal market being uh, obliterated? No, I think it's getting a lot bigger now that the, Why? the product is becoming inferior, oh, and wow. the, the prices are staying high, and the taxes staying high or going up. I think people are just finding other people over the few years that it's became legal that are like you know what we can grow them and we can make it a bit cheaper um but like the last guy that called um oh, well, that's, that's, I, 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 I wouldn't have seen that bit coming the sort of mm-hmm. a bit i mean i'm thinking of chocolate bars and things like that when 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 cadbury's got bought out and the quality of chocolate went down because nestle or, or is it nestle where well, the new owners were, were were reducing the amount of cocoa solids in the chocolate and stuff and i think that another scion of the cadbury family even set up a little business to try and sort of sell higher quality product, as it were, and you're describing a pretty similar phenomenon, I think. My wife's, my wife's, uh, my wife's brother. He grows his own. He grows three huge plants out in his yard every every summer, completely legal, and he dries it, and that's his flower for the whole year. And he doesn't even use a dispensary. And what he's doing is completely legal. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot going on here. And, and the difference it would make in this country, the more we talk about it, the more negligible the difference would be. Except stuff like that. I mean, we haven't got the climate to, to do it in our gardens, but I guess people could do it in their garages. Like William, thank you. Um, again, that state line thing, if you're of a certain age, the, 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 the ghosts of the Dukes of Hazard, Bo and Luke Duke, and of course Daisy... Uh, Bo and Luke Duke, <laughs> they haunt us whenever you consider the idea that if you have been chased by the police, Roscoe P. Coltrane, if you're being, and Enos, if you're being chased by the police and all you had to do was get, you know, if I could get to the line between Brentford and Chiswick, then the police would have to stop chasing me. That, that, that is, I don't know why that's haunting me today. Richard's in Collingwood, uh, Ontario. Richard, what would you like to say? 
Uh, it was legalized here a few years ago, and um, it has been the best thing ever. You go into an environment, like a store environment, where it's clean, knowledgeable staff. Um, they're, they're educated. You can get different strains, different strengths. It's THC, CBD. It's been the best thing ever. And I, I was a little worried. Why? Sorry, go on. No, I, is it, is it, um, I was just going to ask, is it nationwide or is it state-specific as it is in the, in the it's States? Na- it's, it, it's nationwide. Okay. Um, and then uh, I was a little worried because I have kids. I've got a 23-year-old and a 20-year-old. Um, you know, I'm worried about their brain development because they're going to smoke it, but they, yeah. they were, they're smoking it anyway. Yeah. So at least this way they can go and get it. They know exactly what the strength is. They're advised, and I think it's been a wonderful thing. It's now taxed, so the government makes money. Um, it, people aren't turning into potheads and just sitting around doing nothing. It's just <laughs> a great way for me. For, for me personally, I, I have gummies, right. um, and I, I low dose because I'm a bit of a lightweight with it. Sure, uh, but it just helps. It helps me sleep. It just keeps my shuts my brain down a little bit, like having a glass of wine. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think it's been wonderful. And there's no stigma attached. Would you tell anybody that? Would you tell your boss that, or is oh. there still a little bit of? No, nope, no stigma at all. I think you're allowed to grow either four or six plants here personally for your own use. Um, no, I, I think it's wonderful. I, I just go into my dispensary. and I'm, I'm, So Collingwood is a relatively small town north of Toronto. Okay. And it's, um, there's probably about 25,000 people here. And I think we have eight dispensaries. Okay. So, I mean, I did, you know, well, <laughs> my, my instincts are probably correct then, certainly on your experience, is that... If you go back to when we were teenagers, it sounds like such a huge deal. And the conversation was, you know, very, very fractious and people had strong opinions. And But actually, it's it's a sort of gentle move towards what, what you have described. It, overnight, there wouldn't be that. There wouldn't really be any negative. Are there any negatives at all? No, no negatives. There was a certain amount of hype. Your, your previous yeah, caller was that... saying that initially there was a bit of hype, but now it's just normal, calm and... Yeah, you know, people. Are, I, I see people I, I know from the town lining. Uh, not lining up, but going into the store, and it, it's it's like going to a, a, what we have here with our, our beer stores and liquor stores. So you're like standing in the lineup of the beer store. It's uh, it, it's fine. And, uh, there it is. I, and 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 that's again. I think I don't know what the Daily Mail is up to these days in this particular field, but the idea of spooking older generations with a with mythical dangers seems to have been in abeyance it doesn't mean that they couldn't ramp it straight back up again but that that idea of this being the end of civilization as we know it seems seems to me to have died a bit of a death i I could be wrong but that would be a precursor of the process that richard and others have described i mean it it is i guess the case that if you spend a lot of time in places where it's happened you're going to be considerably less spooked by the idea of it happening here than you would be otherwise 1046 is the time it is 10.49 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Zach says, as an ex-user of cannabis for 20 years, I feel any move to legalise will only increase people's dependency on drugs, similar to alcoholism. You, you mentioned not to discuss the psychotic effects, but that is exactly what it does. It causes psychosis and anxiety for, for a relatively tiny number of people, Zach. And I, and I would have thought that in a regulated market, that would be... Uh, less prevalent, that would be easier to um, uh, to, to avoid. Uh, not completely, of course. And, and the question all societies face is uh, how much salience do, do you allow a relatively small pop problem to have on an entire population? Uh, and Paul, I like this. I've heard you say, what was it like in that voice so many times that I now see an image of a small schoolboy sticking his hand up. This story is about standards and safety, James, the ability to know how strong it is and how reliable. Um, The coffee shops in Amsterdam could tell you all about their products. And I think that Paul sort of cancels out Zach in a way. I'm not sure. Um, But but the idea of it no longer being anything like... I mean, what is still on that list? So euthanasia now happens. Esther Ranson, of course, has has a campaign for assisted dying underway at the time when i was doing my sixth form debates esther ransom was probably one of the most famous people in the country and euthanasia had a a, an almost unthinkable air to it you would be very very left field if you were speaking out in favor of that people would think of of sort of soylent green i think uh look it up sci-fi fans uh abortion I, I, I'd like to think this country is firmly rooted in the 21st century, but America has shown us not to take anything for granted. I can't really see fox hunting coming back formally, although this lot are so desperate now that I, I wouldn't put anything past them if they thought it might 
win a few votes. But but the cannabis debate just seems to me to be very sort of sweetly moving towards a, a point where a politician will bring it in, will will do what they've just done in Germany, and there won't be a great deal of fuss at all. Feel free to challenge this consensus, by the way. If, if you find the prospect chilling, frightening, wrong, then tell me why. But I, I do think you'll need to be bringing a little bit more than, than sort of uh, hollow scaremongering to the table, a, a little bit more than sort of reefer madness rhetoric. It would have to be built on your experience of what has happened in other places when they have legalised it. 10.51 is the time. Ruth is in Toronto, Canada, getting a... Uh, you, wait, you wait ages for one Canadian call and then two come along at once. Ruth, what would you like to say? <laughs> yes, thanks, uh, James. Good to talk to you again. Um, first of all, I am neither a drinker nor a smoker nor I do anything with cannabis. So I am one of the people who would not necessarily be in support of this. However, yeah. when we became legal in Canada in October of 2017, there was all this debate. And I can tell you the truth, it's nothing. Yeah. But we have cannabis stores everywhere. But I want to say that, first of all, one of the things that's available is CBD oil for the topical treatment of arthritic pain and so on. And people who would not normally you know, want to have marijuana available and so on have a very effective a treatment available to them that they can get, and seniors, anybody can get it. And... But I don't think no I don't fun. think I don't think CBD oil has um, psychoactive substances in it, does it? No, for sure. But what I'm saying is, they can get this as a very effective treatment, yeah. and there's no embarrassment. Ah, but the okay. funny thing, the, yeah, there's no embarrassment, nothing. But the funny thing about all these stores, and we, I have two within five minutes walking distance of my home. The funny thing about it is, when they open, if there's a queue. They're all seniors. And you talked about the <laughs> older generations in the mail being against this. These are all the people from the 60s who've been waiting for this, and they've all taken it up legally. And yeah, I don't know people who are smoking it who otherwise weren't involved, interested in it. it but it, nowadays... Don't, I don't think it's like, very cool, is it? I don't think young people are sitting there going, oh, I'd love to do that. Because, I mean, in fact, the more mainstream it is, the less... It has that sort of glamorous teenage appeal, perhaps, of rebellion yes. somehow. Yes, and of course, if you're a teenager, you can't legally get it. You have to be at least uh, 19 years of age here. You can't just get it if you're a teenager. But, like I said, the mm. people who I know who are most excited about it and who avail themselves <laughs> of it are people over 50, over 60, over 70. Even my own older brothers, who are uh, two out of four brothers, uh, enjoy it and... The silver smoker, Ruth. The silver smoker is what we're talking about here. And do they? How do they consume it? What means that do they use a vaporizer as opposed to? Because you don't want to be inhaling burning leaves into your lungs, whether no, there's tobacco no. mixed up with it or not. No, they have a. They used a vaporize for one thing, and one brother said that he sometimes used the gummies, but. Um, I am blind, James. You know who I am. I do. I've read I am your blind. book. Yes. God bless you. <laughs> uh, I, um, I am, uh, and blind people have trouble with sleep because I can't tell day from night. Right. And my brother's always trying to convince me that I should try a gummy. <laughs> Just try it. Just try it. And I'm afraid. But, uh, but the fact, there are people who are doing that. And it's, it's a legal way to deal with it and to... Um, yeah, to handle sleep problems. So My brother there. has a very stressful job. He and comes home him. in the evening, has his dinner, has a little uh, has a little hash, and he feels wonderful. And and... Do you know, I know this, this wouldn't affect your condition at all, but it, it was one of those stories I remember reading about 20 years ago, and it stayed with me forever. When I think it was Sue Townsend. Do you know the, the, the author of the Adrian Mole books? Did you ever come across the mm -hmm. Adrian Mole books? Yes, yes. And she had really bad glaucoma, and... Someone passed her a joint at a party, and she yes. took she she took a toke on a joint at a party, and f f she got clearer yes. vision than she'd had in twenty years. It's an extraordinary yes, it story. Glaucoma. It's it an, I, 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 glaucoma. Well, they, it can't be all bad then, can it? If it's actually having a positive effect in areas like that, and as you say, in areas like sort of regulation and sleep. Ruth, thank you so much. Ten fifty-five is the time, and that that's where I think we are now. I, I mean, who's going to do it then? Could Sadiq Khan do it? London wide have an M twenty-five. County line or something like that. I don't know. It's a it's a it's a strange one. But the more you, the, you and also, what if we, what if we used all the revenue raised from legalizing cannabis 
to bring in more environmental policies to, to accelerate the necessary shift towards net zero. Paul's in Halesworth in Suffolk. Paul, what would you like to say? Well, I'd like to say that I am a silver uh, smoker, <laughs> and I have been since 1974. Gosh. Uh, in in the country of Canada, when where it was uh, illegal and uh, where police were spending a lot of time writing up citations, um, and, and putting people in prison and wasting time when uh, yeah. other criminal uh, yeah. So I'm 69 years old, a silver tip, and I I spent one year in Holland. Yes, I've been to many of the coffee shops, so I know that quite well. And and uh, now uh, to my to my surprise that Canada has legalized it, but uh, the good part about that is, is it saves a lot of police time yeah. and uh, jail time. Um, I, I haven't had a bad effect from it. Mind you, cannabis today is much, much stronger than than the cannabis of, of the... Although it'd be cannabis. easier, it'd be easier to, to, to regulate that in the in the Canadian model, because you, you wouldn't be limited to whatever your, your, your man had on him that day, would you? So you still have to indulge in criminality, Paul, to enjoy your habit, do you, in this country? Well, yes, uh, along with probably a few other million people in this country as no, well. No, I'm not, I'm not going to dob you in, mate. I'm not, I'm, not, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not calling you out. I'm just pointing out. No. It seems a little bit ridiculous to to criminalise an otherwise law-abiding 69-year-old man who, who who sounds informed and thoughtful and, 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 and nice. The idea that you then have to engage in criminality to do something that is utterly uncontroversial. Yes, uh, I, I agree with that, and, and it's unfortunate because, uh, yes, I mean, uh, yeah, we come back to Holland, Germany, yes. and uh, Portugal and those countries. Uh, uh, but the thing is that uh, if you were to, to buy cannabis that's government-regulated, the problem with that is it's, it's going to be a different kind of strain. It's going to be grown different. It's going to be more regulated. Uh, that's not a bad thing. But uh, even if you have that there, you're still going to have uh, underground sellers. That's yes. always going to happen. That's never going to come to an end. You'll always have that either way. Well, but not My, least because of age regulation. So you'd have underage people trying to get hold of it, trying to get hold of stuff as well. But it's not a reason not to do it. That's just, I know that's what you're explaining. It's not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, the, the, the way it would... Um uh, well, we haven't had a single negative. I'm familiar with the the dangers and the, the 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 threats posed to young brains that are forming. But all of this is, of course, about legalising it for older people, and and that might actually reduce the supply, the illegal supply for younger people. Because uh, you know, would there be a big enough market to justify? being in the game at all. Paul, thank you. That was a, a very agreeably... I haven't got time to talk to Barry, who, who spends a lot of time in Lanzarote and Tenerife, where they have also apparently um, introduced uh, cafes and, and decriminalisation. But um, I, I don't think we heard a single negative story there. And I wasn't editing. I, I never... I can't edit. I wouldn't know how to. But we, I don't think we took a single negative call. Uh, and, and it's partly, perhaps, because the conversation was about the reality as opposed to some of the rhetoric. Uh, up next on a similar theme, the, the idea that junk food is actually addictive. On your Three minutes after 11 is the time. More on that killing of seven aid workers in Gaza, apparently by the Israeli army. In this hour, we'll be catching up with a correspondent in Israel. Rest assured of that. It, it, I mean, the, it does. And, and one of the aid workers, British as well, of course, Australian, Polish, British, Palestinian and a dual US Canadian citizen. Once again, you, you, you find yourself wondering what the hell we'd be hearing if, if Western journalists were allowed full and uh, traditional levels of access to Gaza by the Israeli government because it is, is um, uh, the case here that, that it's the nationality and the job of the aid workers that has um, uh, drawn the attention. Were, were they mere, and I use that word reluctantly and advisedly, mere Palestinian civilians, then the story would be not have reached us at all via the traditional news channels. Uh, four minutes after 11 is the time. Here's a, I don't think this is a strange one, but bizarrely, given that we have done a lot in this field before together, I don't think we've ever addressed this question directly. And I want to, I want to approach it, as I say, from a slightly different angle. There is a 
conference coming, which will, well, I mean, it does exactly what it says on the tin, actually. It's a fairly self-explanatory title, the International Food Addiction Consensus Conference, which essentially seeks to establish that junk food, ultra-processed food, so this is food that is loaded with unhealthy uh, ingredients, uh, you know, additives or salt, sugar, fat, they're seeking to categorize uh, 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 addiction to ultra-processed food as a substance use disorder on the same sort of page as cocaine, opioid, nicotine, or alcohol misuse. I thought this worked as, a, as an interesting counter to the conversation in the last hour because nobody ever really suggests that cannabis should be put on a list of things that constitute addictiveness in the way that opioids or cocaine or alcohol does. And yet, I, I mean, the idea that we might be moving towards a place where junk food is recognised as more dangerous than cannabis just sort of caught my eye for the moment. But we're leaving cannabis behind now. The, the, the conversation is moving on. Five minutes after 11 is the time. But it's staying in a similar field, except with very unexpected ingredients, namely the idea that that junk food is actually addictive. Now, I think this is one of those stories that I would have been a bit a bit silly about even 10 years ago because I love unhealthy food. I, 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 what I mean by that is I get proper cravings for fish and chips in particular. I love fish and chips. Oh, man, I lie. I, I've got One of my girls asked me this weekend what my death row meal would be, and I, I said... I, it's such a tricky question, that, isn't it? Because you, you think that you know what you'd have as your last meal, but it would depend entirely upon the skills of the chef and the preparation. So if you could have, like, really top quality, straight from the seafront at Wells Next to the Sea, fish and chips, you'd have that. But you're not going to get that. If you're on death row in Texas, you're going to get some manky old piece of fish that's been sitting around for hours. So I, I don't know what, what you would have as your, as your death. This isn't a phone-in topic, by the way. As, as your death row meal, you'd probably have to go for something that this prison kitchen could be relied upon to produce. So cheeseburgers or something like that. But I get proper cravings. And I, I've tried to write about this, not with, I mean, not with complete success, but I certainly made some progress on the idea that we come from a place of guilt and shame often when we attack others. So the fact that I succumb not as much as I used to, actually, but I, I, I succumb to temptation with, with regard to junk food more than perhaps I succumb to any other temptation. And therefore, oddly, and perhaps counterintuitively, it means I have, or I had, less sympathy than I should have had for people who succumb even more than I do. So, so quite often, if you hear... A, a sort of aging bloke on the telly or the radio or writing a newspaper column and they're being obnoxious about obesity, they are unlikely to be paragons of health themselves. It's odd, isn't it? I think that if you're a paragon of health, if you're in absolutely tip-top shape, it's easier to feel sympathy for people who are pursuing incredibly unhealthy eating habits than it is if you're not. And, and I don't know fully why that. A psychologist will be able to tell us. But it's something to do with projection. It's something not self-loathing is probably a bit too strong. But I, because, oh, ew, look at you who can't stop eating. Oh, that's gross, that, because I don't like the fact that I can't actually exercise more self -control. So do you see what I mean? It is self-critical. Self, Maybe it's a bit of self-loathing. I can't stop. I, I shouldn't have had that last night. I shouldn't have had that extra. I shouldn't have eaten that entire Easter egg. I shouldn't have had fish and chips. I should have, I, ah, but. But at least I'm not as bad as that person over there. And therefore, somehow, I, I, I approach that person over there who's got apparently even less self-control than I have. I approach them in a really unpleasant way. I approach, I, I, I become horrible to them. And you will know if you were listening to this problem 10, 15 years ago, this problem, this program, if you were listening to this program addressing this problem 10 or 15 years ago, you, you would have heard me be absolutely vile about obese people. Two or three things changed it for me. I, I, I've written about this in How, How Not To Be Wrong, my second book. Two or three things changed this for me. One was um, a, a, a lovely woman who 
uh, helped, helped look after our children came into our lives and humanized the whole issue for me, just changed the way I looked at everything. Every time I prepared myself on air to be obnoxious about people who had problems with obesity, I'd just see her and think, oh, mate, you shut up, you nasty piece of work, leave that alone. You're talking about real people. It kind of made it, 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 made it real for me rather than just a topic or a theory or a, um, a, a sort of rhetorical flourish. Um, the second thing, actually, was, was, was working out that thing I've just described to you, working out that thing where it comes from. And the third thing was coming to understand, somebody very simply said to me, would you speak about somebody suffering from anorexia or bulimia in the same way that you speak about someone suffering from food addiction? And I said, well, no, of course I, ah, yes, I take your point. So an eating disorder, and few now dispute the reality of eating disorders, an eating disorder can go both ways. If it's made somebody incredibly thin, then the well of sympathy that we can access is is deep and easy. But if it's made someone very, very overweight, that well of sympathy for many of us is rather harder to access. And, and I've just done my best to explain why I think that is, or at least why I think that was for me. So what I want to do today is examine the possibility or probability that junk food is in fact addictive. One newspaper today estimates that 10 million junk food addicts are costing Britain billions. And the way in which we have done this in the past with other addictive substances has been quite straightforward. We're just looking for the line between a guilty pleasure, as it were, and an addiction. I, I, I think, I mean, when you speak to alcoholics, they, the most surprising thing is when they're sitting with a drink in their hand and they really don't fancy it at all, but they kind of have to drink it. That's, that's a, for me at least, that's a knock on the door of addiction. When, when, when people have explained that to me, I've found myself thinking, crikey, I, th I thought it was the opposite problem. I thought you'd be sort of, you know, anticipating every drink with enormous pleasure. But if you're doing that with food, then you've got a big problem, haven't you? I, I, it's, it's, as if you, it's as if you feel that your choice has been taken away. Now, there are two ways into this. There are two ways into this. Quite often on the program, when we find ourselves discussing issues like this, we, 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 we split it straight down the middle between the personal and the, the loved one. And I want to start with the loved one because, because this, is, this is, I presume, an, a really difficult thing to deal with. Someone you love needs to change their diet, right? Someone you love really, really, really needs to change their diet. Listen, they might need to need to do other things as well, like give up the booze or, or, or exercise more, but we're focusing entirely upon food this hour. Some, something, someone you really love, possibly a parent or a partner or a child. Let's put it in that category to start with. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolutely intimate link. It's parent, partner or child. And you're watching them maybe not kill themselves, but you're watching them reduce their life expectancy daily and you can't get through to them. I want to know what that's like. I want to know what you think is going on in their head. And, and it, it, it's so tricky to say the right thing, isn't it? It's so tricky to, 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 to avoid the bridling or to avoid the attack, to avoid the, uh, the, the pushback. You know, don't tell me what to do. But you know, and, you're, and your position, your motivation is coming entirely from a place of love. You're sort of saying, Dad, come on. You, you've got to stop this. You are making yourself ill. I want to know what that's like. I want to know what you think about the the growing conviction or the growing consensus that you can be addicted to junk food in the same way that you can be addicted to alcohol and illegal drugs, all right? 0345 606 I think you can poo-poo this idea if you want to, but try to do so from a, from a kindly position rather than a condescending one, all right? Just because you find it easy to control your impulses or because you find it easy to resist temptations doesn't necessarily mean that the, the, the problem of addiction, food addiction, doesn't exist. So that's, that's angle one, is talking about someone you love who is in this position. Angle two is more obvious. 
Angle two is much more obvious. Uh, 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 and yet, I wonder whether you can find the words to articulate what I'm looking for now. Because I want you to tell me, as somebody who thinks that they are addicted to food, and you may not have had this thought before this morning, you may not have known even that the increasing swathes of the medical establishment see your problem in the same light that they see alcoholism or drug addiction. What's, what's the, because this is going to be the hardest thing to explain because everybody eats, you know, um, not everybody takes drugs, but a lot of people who do don't end up addicted to them. Alcohol is probably the best example. Most people, most adults have a drink, but the adults who cannot stop or the adults who cannot live without it or the adults who are damaging their lives and their health in profound and lasting ways are, are, are very difficult for the rest of us to understand because you're just like, well, you know, just take a fortnight off or, or drink less or move from, to, to, to low alcohol beer or alcohol free beer that that n the notion of addiction if you haven't been there of all the things that we discussed together i think that addiction is is one of the weirdest because you either get it 100 percent or you get it naught percent and you know how this program works whenever we find ourselves caught in that space where many of us are naught percent and some of us are 100 percent, we try to build bridges behind the two positions we try to help the naught percent come to a slightly better understanding of the hundred percent so the stupidest thing you can do and i'm a bit embarrassed to admit that this is what i used to do the stupidest thing you can do in conversations like this is posit even for a moment the idea that everybody needs to be like you or that everybody is like you you know addiction is real so the fact that you're not an addict does not prove that addiction is not real any more than the fact that you haven't got flu at the moment proves that flu doesn't exist. I'd, I'd always find this position quite extraordinary. And yet there is some room for resistance, I think, to the idea that, that junk food, ultra-processed food, can be addictive in the same way and should be medically regarded as being addictive in the same way that drugs and alcohol are. So how would you describe the difference between being somebody who eats too much junk food, which applies to a huge number of us, and somebody who is, you think, you believe, you know, addicted to junk food, to ultra-processed food? The difference between someone who eats it and knows that they shouldn't and sometimes almost immediately wishes that they hadn't, but can then go for, you know, three months without touching a, 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 a morsel. And someone who is actually addicted, someone who has an addiction that needs, if you'd pardon the pun, that needs feeding. All right? So what's it like to love someone in that situation? That provides us, provides us with one perspective. And what's it like to be in that situation? How do you know you are in that situation as opposed to simply, simply tragically being unhealthy. Addiction, the nature of the addiction itself is what I'm after. And uh, I've got great faith in you uh, for, for uh, uh, providing it today. 1118 is the time. The number you need, 0345 6060 973. It's 1118. 21 minutes after 11 is the time. 10 million junk food addicts costing Britain billions. So if, if you need a little encouragement from the uh, less compassionate side of politics to care about this story, that there it is. It would save the NHS billions of pounds, um, 58 billion pounds a year, according to one estimate. If, if Well, I mean, you're not going to cure everybody, but you, you, the more you reduce junk food addiction, the more money you save, or the more money the NHS saves. Um, Seamus is in Rochester. Seamus, what made you pick up the phone? Oh, it was just about the part where you turned around and said, like, are you the person that were living that? And I was living that. Unbeknown to me, I was living that. I was doing shift work yeah. uh, in, when I lived in central London. Um, so my morning routine, if I was doing earlies, I'd be up, I'd have toast and tea, leave the house. There'd be a baker's en route. Um, in Sainsbury's, I'd get some stuff from Sainsbury's, I'd then go into work. After the, the morning peak, we would then do breakfast. 
um, sandwiches would come out at lunchtime. On my way home, I would sneak into one of these big, massive food chains that had the big golden gates. Yeah. Um, I would get that. I would pick the kids up from school, meet me missus. We'd have snacks on the way home. Get in. I'd have another snack. We'd have dinner. Nine o'clock, I would have my... Um, I'd have what we used to call supper, yeah. tea and toast or a snack. I did this religiously for years. So going from 18 to 19 stone, very quickly having the money, having access to fast food and being and I've always been a sneaky eater. It goes back to my childhood. That's okay. another day. That's another conversation. Well, briefly, so, though, because it makes you feel briefly happy. Oh, for briefly, yeah. So that's, and, that's why it goes back to your yeah, childhood. Yeah, and it? literally, you can literally today, even when I was doing it, you had fast foods virtually near enough on every street corner yes up and down the high street and it was cheap it was cheap nasty ingredients but it was addictive when did you, you know realize I mean? you had a problem and how how, oh, how? how big my, did you get how big did you get right so i went from about 18 19 stone right and within eight months i shot up to just under 30 stone I did know, and this is because your income improved. You think this is just because you had a few more pounds in your pocket? What I mean, because that's such that a sh- help, right? That did help, but it was um, I, uh, right. So my part of my job, I worked on the railway, on 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 the platforms, you know, in a major London station. Okay. So when I was on the platforms, I was walking. I was walking uh, about okay. seventeen. 18 miles without knowing up and down the platforms, blah, blah, blah. Yes. So whatever I ate, I was thinking, when I got a different job upstairs in the control room, it was more of an office environment. So therefore, my thinking, oh, well, I can eat that, I can eat that, and I just carried on eating, 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 and I just carried on ballooning, so, ballooning, so ballooning. When did when would we bring the word addiction into this conversation then? Because at the moment, you just, you, just, you just sound like a bloke who really liked his snap. You know? No, it was early stages. It was really, truthfully, early stages. The addiction to food, because food is... Uh, it, it's, right, if you've either got money for food or you haven't, and yeah. when you haven't, you look for the cheaper option. Right. And sometimes it is that establishment on that high street <laughs> that you have to feed. But when you've got that little bit That's of extra cheap. money in your pocket, yeah. it doesn't matter where it goes because you can always justify, oh, well, I can get that, I can get that, I'll do this, that, and the other. But without knowing it, that was just that. The amount of fizzy pop drinks that I used to Just go through chucking it down day. your neck. So when did the alarm yeah. go off then, Seamus? Right. So I got up to a size 38 waist. My neck... That's not very big. That's that was for me, uh, no, not 38, 48 waist. Yeah, I was going to say. All I right, was, that's big. I was huge. I yes. was huge. The shirts, my uniform had to be specially made. And wow. um, they were looking at disciplining, um, not so much discipline getting rid of me, because of the amount of money I've cost them over six months to do my uniform, and it wasn't cheap. Right. And they were looking. So I got a big kick up my rear by my missus and a very, very close friend at work. Okay. And I hadn't seen this close friend in work for about eight months. She was a guard. I was in the control room. I trained her when she joined, and et cetera. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, she saw me, and she didn't recognise me at first. And then as I've gone past oh, her wow. up the stairs... Even within an eight-month window. Yeah. yeah, and she has turned... And she gave me the biggest kick in. And I went into not, work... Not literally. Well, not really, no. verbally, but I went into work. Um, I went and locked myself into the toilet. Um, Go on. And I had a complete meltdown. Oh, man. Because of the person that I used to be to the person that I was looking at. Yeah. I was, I was, I was a beast. I was, I, I, it, it wasn't right for the person looking back. Gosh. Do you know what I mean? Of course um, I do. Of course I do. But you're explaining it so I've well. I've been on the 10 year pro. Like, it's oh. taken me 10 years to lose that weight. Um, and I've lost it. I still have moments where, where I, I do the secret eating and that. I, why, I don't know. But, you know, um, 
You now do I'm know. You probably you, prob- you probably do know why, don't you? Yeah. It, well, so you've know. halved your weight then. You've come down uh, to even. You're even slimmer than you were before you <clears throat> before things went a bit out started, of control. Um, so the reason still, why you still do it is because it it it, it alters your brain's reward system. Yeah. It's it the makes neurological. Me feel time, yeah, just for that little. Of even, how, yeah. What yeah. I'm stuffing down my throat, um, and it, like, I've even found myself doing it very recently, um, oh. sitting up late um, and comfy. It, well, you need to talk to your wife about that a bit, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I do. I and do. just tell her that. Tell her that you're you, you're you're having a tough time in other areas at the moment. Um, I lost my mum. Oh. Two years ago, and I lost my dad very recently. Yeah, so that so you're doing you're you're reaching back for the old support mechanisms that just yeah, give you that gives you that little short term boost, but in the long term yeah. you're doing you said that your mum and dad wouldn't want you to be doing that, would they? No, no, but I just find it hard. Like, well, could, well it is hard. That's the thing, and that's what you've just helped. God knows how many people understand how hard it actually is. You've just explained to hundreds of thousands of people something that they didn't understand before. But these companies are very smart, and these companies are are really, really smart. These people that put the food chains on the high street, they're very smart. They're very smart, but they're also very, very cunning in what they do and what they they sell and how they do it. Because it's people like me that would just think, ah, should I go and buy this? It's so easy. It's so easy. If if something unhealthy can't be that easy, if it was that bad for us, it wouldn't be so easy, would it? Exactly. Exactly. But it is, and you know it is. Yeah. You know yeah. it is. And you're, 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 yeah. you're doing great, mate. You're doing brilliantly. We all wobble. I'll get there. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll get there. It's of just that I'm are. going through a rough time at the moment. But Well, this this so isn't going to help. This isn't no. going to help. But you but no, you know that. You know that. Yeah. And you'll, you'll push through. You push through what you've pushed through before. You'll push through this as well. You know you yeah, will. Yeah, sorry for getting upset. Why I you do apolo- apologize. Don't you apologise to me. You can ring me up and get upset whenever you want, Seamus. Oh, can I? Anytime. Right. Well, That's maybe not every single day. Okay? <laughs> I've got to let others on. <laughs> you might. There you, you go. You've been a really, really good help. Right. Well, yeah. You've and also I hope been. That I can help someone if I can just literally well, yeah. help someone by stopping going into that or taking that bar of chocolate yeah. or even taking that last packet of crisps or them biscuits at stupid o'clock in the morning. If you <laughs> can just stop and just reflect on what you're doing and what you're t- intaking it might not seem nothing at that precise moment but just think why are you doing that what has made you do this when you don't normally do this at this time of the day or this time of the night why are you getting up to go to toilet then going down and having a sneaky drink mm. fizzy pop or chocolate you don't need to do that because you know what you're better than that you're 100 percent better than that and we all need somebody to give us that kick up that arse sorry (laughs) sorry i do apologize we need that we need that we need that one person that can see what's going on around us and be honest and you've got to take it on the chin to be frank and take it on the chin if you want to do better for yourself the only person that could help themselves is you None of these fancy. Don't even bother going off to the NHS or well, to the I'd, doctors. I'd, I'd, I'd rein you in there because everybody. It's horses for courses, and what what has worked for you? What that, has worked for you? Because some of the is. NHS treatments are fantastic. But you're right. In the in the first instance, flicking that switch that you've just described. Only you can flick that switch, but some of yeah, us would. Definitely. Some of definitely. us would need a bit of help finding the switch. Some of some of us would need a bit of help flicking the switch. You you, you are a legend, Seamus. You really are, and I'm so proud of you. You keep it up, mate. Seriously, it's eleven thirty-one. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. Thirty-three minutes after eleven is the time. We'll be crossing uh, to Israel shortly for the latest on the well, two stories really. One, the absolute destruction of Gaza's Al Shifa hospital, and two, the killing of seven aid workers uh, by the Israeli Defence Force, despite reports that the um, charity for which they worked, the World Central Kitchen, had shared details of their itinerary with with the IDF. They had coordinated their convoys' movements with the IDF, but nonetheless, seven now are dead, an Australian, Polish, British, Palestinian, and uh, and a dual US-Canadian citizen among them. Noga Tarnopolsky is a freelance journalist in Jerusalem who has helped us out on this program and uh, the, the the wider station LBC many many times um, since this 
conflict began, uh, of course, with that Hamas terror attack on Israel uh, in Israel on October the seventh of last year, and and Noga joins us now. I, I, I don't imagine there's much to add, so just bring us up to date with with what we know, Noga, if you would, about this world world central kitchen um, uh, uh, attack or, or, or accident yeah, or whatever. Yes, disaster is a good word. Well. Um, I guess the latest, which I think you know, is that the the Israeli army has acknowledged that its shooting is what killed these um, um, aid workers. Um, the spokesperson for the Israeli army just put out a video a few minutes ago. I have to say a bit of a stiff video. Go on. In which he acknowledged that an incident occurred last night. He said he had spoken with Schiff. Jose Andres, the owner of World Central Kitchen, the founder, yeah. and he said that it would be independently investigated. Um, but it's still very difficult to understand because the activity that these workers were engaged in, which was moving food from boats to a warehouse, had been coordinated with the IDF. And so I think we have to... I really, you know, demand that the Israeli army dig deep to find out how such a catastrophe could occur. And the Israeli um, foreign minister just put out a statement in which I think he raises some doubts about how this is going to be run because he said, and I quote, the Israeli foreign minister Israel Katz said that the IDF quote, and decision makers mm -hmm. are going to be investigating it. And if he may have just, you know, said not whatever, but if he's saying the truth, and that means politicians are going to get involved, I think we have to wonder how this is being handled. Um, I, is there much precedent for this? It, 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 I mean, certainly in the context of the recent conflict, of, of the current conflict, is, is there much precedent for the idea of undertaking an investigation into its own actions, which satisfies all observers? I don't think... I don't think all observers are ever satisfied. True. Um, there was, in the context of the current war, there were two incidents. One is more comparable than the other. The first is when an AP photographer was shot and killed by Israeli fire in southern Lebanon in the very, very first few days of this war. That was investigated. The Israeli army acknowledged that it had shot him, but... Um, said, explained that it was in an active zone of combat, which was true, um, and that he wasn't targeted. The more comparable terrible incident was, I think about a month and a half ago, three Israeli hostages who, through incredible initiative and verve, had managed not only to survive um, captivity by Hamas, but also to escape and to make their way out. They undressed, so they were just in their boxers, they had no tops on, they had their hands up, and three, these three Israeli citizens were walking towards the soldiers to beg for rescue. They had a white flag they were carrying, and they were shot dead. They weren't even shot in the legs. So I think that's the most comparable incident, and I don't think the families are satisfied that they've gotten proper responses from the army. I, I mean, one, it, one of the families has sued the army. Yes. I, I, I mean, it calls into question, and I hope this doesn't sound crass, what is going on the rest of the time? Because when either members of an aid convoy or, or you know, Israeli citizens who'd previously been held hostage are shot in this fashion, it seems unlikely to an objective observer that these are freakish occurrences that are not happening more regularly to people who don't automatically demand the attention of the world's media or indeed of their own country's government. I agree. I think that what we're seeing is a military that is suffering from a serious crisis of discipline among its troops. Um, we have to also say that we're seeing an, a military that is basically being abused by the government that is supposed to be leading it. The, the commander-in-chief under the Israeli system, the commander-in-chief of the army is the government through the branch of the cabinet. And what is happening in Gaza now, I, I spoke with someone there today, is that 
soldiers are basically sitting around doing nothing. The war has more or less ended in Gaza. And they're, as, as this guy said to me, just sitting around waiting to be hit in the head by an RPG. True. They're sitting ducks, they're bored, and they may be losing the trust, you know, confidence in their commanders mm. because the government refuses to dictate how this war will end or even how this war will proceed. So I think it's a major, major crisis that we're seeing. I, I also have to tell you, I think that this incident with World Central Kitchen yes. is going to be a turning point in this war. But because it will motivate foreign governments to uh, strengthen their position. Yes, and also remember, right now as we speak, there are about 100,000 Israelis surrounding the Knesset already uh, demanding that Netanyahu go. And this will be you know, attacking aid workers who are undeniably innocent aid workers yeah. is even the Israeli public that is scared of Hamas is not going to be able to swallow that one easily. Um, and, and then we come to the Al-Shifa Medical Center, the hospital in Gaza from which the IDF has withdrew. And an, an almost unbelievable contrast between one account of what has happened there and, and another. So we, we, we'll begin with Naftali Bennett, the former prime minister, of Israel, who has described it in in glowing terms, really, as a, as a remarkable achievement, with civilians evacuated and terrorists killed and and captured, and and the the, the quote, and I read this just to be clear, mm -hmm. a verbatim quote that no civilian was killed, a claim that this is unprecedented in urban warfare, and uh, our military is learning and improving by the day. And then footage, including verified footage from reputable news agencies of of the. The devastation visited upon that hospital, which couldn't contrast more starkly with what a very senior Israeli politician has publicly claimed. How, how do we know? How do we find the truth on a on a story like this? Well, it's very difficult to. Let me just say that first of all, the footage that you're seeing is all footage released by the Israeli army. They have not allowed any journalists in or any independent observers in. So even footage released, let's say, by the AP, mm. um, some may have been gotten by stringers still working for them in Gaza, but almost all of it is Israeli army um, footage. The other thing is that the two things you're describing are not necessarily contradictory. Okay. In other words, civilians and patients may have been removed from the hospital and still the hospital may have been absolutely destroyed. It's very, very, very hard uh, to know. I have not heard myself, um, you know, I haven't heard any specific numbers of patients or of medical aid workers in Shifa who were killed during the Israeli operation, but it's very possible that that did happen and that we just don't know. Um, I think that the Israeli policy of basically trying to blank out its activities in Gaza is really boomeranging on the country because in the absence of concrete information, um, people imagine the worst and we can't help that but do that. And I guess to that end, and, and I, I don't want to tempt you into territory where, where you're uncomfortable, but what, what's your reading today, Noga, of how the unfolding and continuing events are affecting Israel's status in the eyes of the rest of the world. I'm thinking particularly of allies. I'm thinking of that UN resolution, which America for the first time didn't reject, didn't resist. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the idea yeah. that, that Netanyahu has arguably started to hemorrhage 60 years worth of goodwill in recent months. I would agree with that statement. Oh. I think that the war has been mishandled among other, uh, from other aspects, it has mm. been terribly mishandled in terms of Israel's representation to the world. And I think that Israel has lost a good 60 years of slowly building up diplomatic stature. And that is one of the claims that all of these uh, protesting Israelis have against the prime minister. Mm that he has destroyed the nation standing in the world in addition to destroying so many institutions and and so much security within the state. We have to remember this whole thing started with the worst security failure in the history of the state, and that happened under this government's watch. And still no clear 
picture of how it ends. Final question. That's right. And, and more and more, I would say, credible claims from serious Israeli, especially former military top officials who say that this war in Gaza is over and it's being continued solely for the purpose of Netanyahu trying to hold on to power. Noga, thank you. Noga Tarnopolsky, a freelance journalist there based in Jerusalem who has been following events since October the 7th from uh, from that perspective and, and uh, as you can gather very closely indeed, um, grim, inevitably, and, and I suppose predictably grim um, uh, news today, but, but also that bigger picture, that broader perspective of what, what Netanyahu's mission uh, is likely to have visited upon his country for, 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 for coming generations in terms of, of feeling and, and attitude, status and support. It's, shall I do one from Oenidiet's Corner? Seems a little bit inappropriate in the context of the conversation that we're having, but James has been in touch with quite a strange message in which he stresses that he's a straight white male but also adds, seeing as you're so fair and unbiased, laugh out very loud. Would you care to speak about your far left Hamas fans with swastikas in London this weekend, old pal? Um, mate, I, I think you need to give your head a wobble, frankly. But yeah, sure. I, I mean, uh, the, the deployment of swastikas in the criticism of Israel is despicable and disgusting. And pretending that one person carrying a swastika on a, on a march in London this weekend is somehow representative of anybody other than the one person carrying a swastika in London on a march this weekend is also despicable and disgusting. So uh, there you go. I, you're welcome. It's 11.45. It is 11 minutes to 12 and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC where we return our attention now to this, uh, I mean, simultaneously remarkable and yet very ordinary story about 10 million according to one newspaper this morning, junk food addicts costing Britain billions. And and I don't know that anyone will do a better job than Seamus of driving home the notion that junk food can be as addictive as, as more obviously addictive substances like alcohol and, 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 and nicotine or, or indeed opioids and cocaine. I, I, what's it like to watch someone? It was interesting that Seamus referred to his wife and an old friend who gave him the impetus that he needed to recognise the scale of his problem and a 10-year and, and counting recovery period. But what's it like to watch somebody who, who you know has got a problem? You know this isn't just overindulgence. This is, this is life-threatening addiction to profoundly unhealthy substances, in this case food. Right, can, can, you, can you reach them? Or, or, or do they have to sort of reach themselves? I, I'd, I'd love to know what that experience is like, if we have time. Chrissy is in Glasgow. Chrissy, what made you pick up the phone? Good morning, James. Um, thanks for taking. Hi, thanks for taking my call. This is a very complicated subject. Um, I'm calling about myself and my own food addiction. Um, I've been addicted to food um, all of my life, and when you said something there about um, the headline saying 10 million junk food addicts. Yeah. My initial thought was not only is that an exaggeration but it's a dilution of the truth in the sense that it's a colloquialism. It, it, you, you can't be saying um, it, all of them are junk food addicts. Mm. This is where the, it, it kind of dilutes the term addict. What, what they're saying is 10 million people are really eat a lot of junk food and, and frequently and often and they're overweight and they're costing us a fortune. I don't believe that there are 10 million junk food addicts. No, I understand what you're saying. So it's, it's a question of, I mean, in many ways, that's the question that I'm asking is where is the line between, you know, poor information, low... Uh, low resistance, if you like, and, and genuine addiction. Where would you put that line? Because you clearly cite yourself on the other side of it, on the addicted side of it, don't you? Yes, I do. And um, I meant to say all power to Seamus, pat on the back for mm. the progress he's made. Very good for him. And a Seamus for me, because I'm at the other end of the spectrum, I would say from him in some ways, but he does highlight the fact that it is a spectrum. And regardless of that spectrum, everybody's going to have their own individual now, experiences. Seamus clearly um, is very emotionally affected by his journey. But to me, looking at Seamus's journey, I'm like, oh, I wish I had that. You know, not belittling Seamus at all. Well, let's talk about realizing, you. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. Um, yeah, my. Um, I will order a junk food in bulk and I will keep it in the house. And if I don't have. 
um, junk food in the house, I will get sweats, palpitations, um, I will start to shake, um, I start to slightly panic, um, I will, in the middle of the night, get pack up everything into the car and go find somewhere that sells it. Um, my problem particularly is with um, sugar, um, right. so chocolate and stuff like that. Um, and, and it's and it's so trivialised and it's made superficial because everybody, chocolate's a cheery thing, it's social, you know, food's a social cheery thing and how can you possibly Just come associate back to you, come, it with... Come back to you, because I, I, I know it's tough, and but the temptation oh, I'm to sorry. start talking about other people or society, I'm interested in you. How, how do you know it's an addiction? When did you... When would you right. have first started using the word addiction to describe yourself? Yeah, I'm sorry, James. It's all right. It's, it's, it's my job. It's, it's, I just, my, I'm just conscious of the time, and I, I want to get to the as far into your experience as I as I yeah. can. So, when when would you have used that word first? Do you think to describe yeah. yourself? Uh, very early teens, uh, oh, possibly slightly sooner. My um, I had an emotionally neglectful um, childhood. Yes. Um, I didn't hear. I love you. You know, I yes. never got I'm hugs sorry. or anything I'm really. Sorry. It wasn't. That's not fair. That's so unfair. It's, it's um, yeah, it's not great. Um, I make up for it with my kids. They've got plenty, but I, I got none. Okay. And as a result, my personality has been knitted with trying to please others, etc. But yes. my intense hatred of, or my intense belief there's something wrong with me, etc., led me to to just reach for food. I discovered quite that it made me feel better mm. and I would sit alone so often I mean I would actually steal money from like my mum's purse or wherever I could go written to find money in pockets to go and buy junk food and I would eat it as fast and as quickly as I could I would hide the wrappers um, and that began in that cycle and you get and a little been, you get a little dopamine hit in your brain and, yeah. and for a moment you feel better you feel better there's no other word yeah. for it really yeah, yeah, and it's it seems, and you don't get any kind of sympathy for being overweight when the weight starts keeping up, which of course exacerbated the abuse that I got from uh, it makes my you mother. Feel worse the rest of the time as well. It's, it's, it does, it does. So and what's your health like you, now, Chrissy? What's your health like now? Um, I it's going to kill me, James. <laughs> Go on. Hey. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. You take your time. So you can it's say going, that. You can sorry, say that to it's me. It's going to kill me. Yeah, it's going to kill me. I'm 49. If I haven't, if I haven't sorted it now, when am I ever going? I spent five thousand pounds on a gastric band about ten years ago, mm. and I had it in for four years, and it was an absolute nightmare, and it was completely missold yeah. because my problem wasn't portion control. My problem was was chocolate and and stuff, and you can still get that down it melts mm. so it was a complete I should have spent it on therapy or, or something and I don't go out anymore James because you know I've even had people driving by in vans shouting you know horrible names I'm not going to say what they are yeah. my health now um, I have got an ongoing problem with atrial fibrillation which I've had since my teens which is kind of unusual but that adds to the, the possibility of me having a stroke okay. um, I'm insulin resistant um, I, I weigh about 155 kilos, which I don't even know what that is in stone, but that's more than double what I should weigh. Right. Um, and I just hate myself, James, and I don't go out anymore. Well, that's and not your fault. It's, 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 you, you, a lot of this, a lot of what you're describing to us is a reaction to things that have happened to you rather than anything that's in and of yourself but but you but yeah. you you this is i guess this this is part of what we're trying to pin pin down is the knowledge that what you're doing is causing you immense harm but you cannot help yourself you cannot stop have there ever been periods of improvement chrissy yes when yes tell me actually. about them tell me about that when 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 life has been stable, when it's been good, when okay. I've had, yeah, when it, when I got in a relationship mm. and uh, when my children were very young and, and I was taking them camping and I was kind of active and things, I would still say I had, you know, a real liking for junk food, but I didn't do what I do now, which is order it in bulk to make sure that it's there. <sighs> 
And and I mean, yes. there, there's no one you Sorry. can talk to about this. There's no one you can. I've asked my GP for a referral to the weight management service, and yeah. after two years, I got my referral, and I'm on a waiting list that's at the moment ten months long. Um, I don't even I don't even know if they can help me. I feel too far gone. You're not too I don't far know gone. If no, no one's ever too far gone. It's, it's, I mean, all, all, you, all, all we'll have eventually is better late than never. But it's there's no such thing as too far gone. There's always a way back. There's always a way back. And and the thing about addiction, I drink a lot of um, uh, diet <laughs> and inverted commas um, sodas. You know right. the the. the, the well, they're, I no drink good. A they're not good them. for you either, are they? They're no good for you, and they're no good for your teeth because the acid in them is terrible. Yeah. But there is some research that the artificial sweeteners in them boost your appetite and then contribute to obesity. So although you're not drinking the calories in the juice, you might be you doing are, yourself within about on... 20 minutes. Well, why don't you're like, you start really with them? I, I don't want to sound stupid, and, and tell me to bog off if, if I do but why don't you just start with them because you don't crave the drinks do you really like you crave the other stuff well that's that's where you're wrong James oh, I'm sorry. that's where I will correct you yeah, it's, uh, I, no, no I will correct you, you. I'm, I, no, it, you're educating me Chrissy I, that's okay I'm sorry I don't mean to sound so condescending um, what, 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 I had four crates of them delivered yesterday um, oh, from online thing, yeah. and I I have a special shelf that they go on, and I was I was looking for the van because I only had one can left, and I was sipping it and sipping so it and the, going part, where is this part of the van dependency. coming? In. Does it make you feel safe when they arrive when the crates arrive? Does it make you feel safe? Yes, yes. uh huh. Yes, I go right. Okay, I've got my I've got my yeah. fizzy juice. I'm okay. I've got my I've got that boost I'm all right when I need it. Um, Something interesting, actually. I'm a carer for my disabled daughter. Right, I can um, hear her, I think. It, yeah, she's off school just now. And uh, shout out to her. She's been really good. Yeah. Um, and with Easter, it's a bad time for me because I've got to guard against eating her Easter treats. Yes. And that's something that people kind of giggle about because they should. It's kind of funny. Oh, my sure. gosh, my kid goes to bed and I'm lunching the Easter egg. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of that. But for someone like me with an addiction, I've got to prepare myself to make sure that I don't eat what's hers because then I'll have the guilt on top. So that's why I just ordered a big so box much of to keep yourself cream. covered. Yeah, to give egg yourself body an eggs, so I can sit and I, when I feel it, I can just eat it, and I I'm not touching hers. I am. Um, I'm not. So I'll put on more weight. I, I know. I, 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 as a hers. consequence of doing the right thing and, and and looking after your little girl, you you know, I can't I can't offer you any form of support or advice because I'm not. I'm I'm simply not qualified. I can tell you that you sound lovely. You sound like a really, really lovely person and a great mum, and and that should, you know, pro probably be something that you need to try to recognise a little bit more. Everybody listening to this is is, is going to be feeling nothing but love and sympathy for you, regardless of what some scumbags might shout at you in the street. You're you're, you're a nice person. What's inside has nothing to do with what's on the outside. And and I, again, I, I, quite a few people. And you've probably tried it already, but are suggesting that Overeaters Anonymous might help, or at least it's worth finding a, a meeting for that. But that would involve you getting yourself out there and getting yourself down there. But but you know, I, I don't I don't think <clears throat> I don't think you're going to be able to do this on your own, Chrissy. If you if you want to to get out of that place where you mm -hmm. where, where, where you know that you're shortening your life, I don't think you can do it on your own, my love. So I think I think. I think we look for something, and, and the NHS has got you on the waiting list, so you find something like OA. There's, there's online, you put in your postcode, it'll find you a meeting. You can't do this on your own, Chrissy. No one can do this on their own. I'm just so ashamed. There's James. nothing to be ashamed so, of. There's nothing to be I'm ashamed just, of. Do you know, my oldest daughter, who's, who's 30, Yeah. Um, she just got engaged after 11 years with this absolutely wonderful, wonderful man. Okay. We've just got engaged. An absolutely dream engagement. It's beautiful, wonderful. My initial thought was, oh, my God, I'm going to ruin her wedding photos. Well, that was my very first thought after... What's she like? The, uh, well, what's she like, your daughter? She's amazing. She is the nicest, kindest girl um, and I actually said to her, like, I'm really worried about how I'll look. Yeah. If you don't want me in the photos, darling, I will not be offended. 
and she went, don't be ridiculous. She was, you know, yeah, she, she grounds go. me and says, I oh, don't care. Do you think what it's, you do you think it's an like. accident or, or a coincidence that she's such a lovely young woman? Oh, it's, it's all down to me, clearly. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not all of it. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a centuries-old tension between nature and nurture, but most people recognise that both play at least a bit of a part in how we all turn out. So, so you did that. You can do that. You can at least start doing this, I think. Well, the, the interesting thing is that it's much easier to control somebody else's diet than your own. I, I get and my that. Little girl, my little girl's got Down syndrome, and people with um, Down syndrome do tend to be kind of heavier set and yes. a bit chunky. Yes. Um, and it can be quite difficult to um, curb my wee girl's loving of snacks. Um, it's something, that, again, that we make light of. Should people people laugh and giggle at the idea that she'll climb on stools to get to food. Yeah. But for me, it's a nightmare. I have to lock cupboards, etc. But I, it, it's a constant it battle to keep her, yeah, but I can't do it. From, I, I just, I'm saying I can't, but it makes me sound lazy. No, you, um, do you know what you need to do? And, and this I am going to say to you, despite not having any qualifications or rights, or, or, or you've got to just, sometimes you've got to look at the world, and if the world isn't being very nice to you, you've got to tell the world to, 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 to get lost. To, to go to idiot's corner. I can't say it. I can't say yeah, idiot, whatever you want to call it. You've just got to, you've yeah. got to mm-hmm. tell it. And and these meetings, these OA meetings, you can do them on Zoom if you want. You can get involved. Oh, on, can I? Yeah, you can get involved on Zoom. There are people so that you can, you know, get over those hurdles with help and and more slowly, smaller. Just, just you, I know you can do. You know you can do. You've raised the girl. You're you're looking after your little one. Your your, your older girl is out there in the world, being wonderful. You can do this, and it's never too late. It's never ever ever too late. I started therapy at thought forty five changed my life i wasn't i wasn't I, I, I wasn't struggling as much as you are i wasn't suffering as much as you are but i sat there once and thought god i wish i'd done this when i was 30 everything would have been different and then i thought well hang on a minute why, why not look at the road ahead instead of the road behind and see if we can change the road ahead and stop worrying about the road behind and stop worrying about what stupid people say and think because they really don't matter at all but you know when you know when good things happen and yeah. people say good things and nice things. Yeah. One, it, it only takes one person to hint something nasty and you kind of focus on that. Don't you, that kind of human nature? Well, I do. I do. And I, I, I suppose that's maybe just a confidence thing. Of course it is. And it goes but, back to your mum, Chrissy. Stuff them. Stuff them. Stuff them oh, all. she dragged me to the doctor when I was 11 and she had me virtually with a scruff of the neck. And that's when I had started putting on a bit of weight. But I remember oh. I was 11 years old and she took me to the doctor with a scruff of the neck and she threw it. She went, fix her. Good Lord. Fix her. She's got fat. Fix her. I'm sorry. And she would find the uh, wrappers and I would get really badly punished. And it wouldn't stop me, though. It well, wouldn't stop me. You know there's a lot going on here, don't you? And you know that none of it, and it, it is your fault. And you know that I have never been later for the news. Chrissy, you know? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, James. Don't you apologise to me, madam, all right? And in fact, one little thing, maybe stop apologising. You've got nothing to say sorry for. Everything that you've described to me today was done to you, not by you. And everything that you do to yourself is a reaction to what has been done to you. So listen, just just look after yourself, okay? Thank you. All right? Lots of love to you, Chrissy. You take care. And you. You too. All right, I hope we talk again. It's 12.06. It is nine minutes after 12, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. And we will turn our attention next to... I, I mean, it's a story that dominates front pages today, or at least um, uh, command space on, on, on almost all of them. And, and I'm talking about the, the full gamut from the Times on one side of the sensible uh, street and then the express squarely on the other. And it involves an intervention from the author J.K. Rowling on the uh, so-called hate crime law that has been introduced in Scotland. And if you sense a certain reluctance in my voice, then you're quite right to, because well, I've got two problems here. Well, I've got about 99, actually, but that ain't one. I've got two problems here. The first is I remain convinced that approximately 80% of us 
don't really bite on this story. I, I, I mean, the sort of live and let live approach to life seems to serve as well in so many other areas. And yet then you've got 10% of people who are diametrically and passionately opposed to each other for whom these stories, and, and it is the transgender um, element of the hate crime law that J.K. Rowling has, has once again concerned herself with, that, 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 that those, those vying 10%, those opposed 10% uh, seem to think that it is the most important issue in the world at the moment. And of course, you know, uh, objectively speaking, you have to at least entertain the possibility they may be right. Maybe this is a much, 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 much bigger deal than the rest of us realise. But one thing that you can tell as a phone-in host, and remember that if you work here, you can see the switchboard 24-7, whether you're on air or not, that some of the traditional tactics used to stoke up hatred or, or, or controversy or to get people to start biting chunks out of each other, they still don't work. The phones still don't ring. In fact, I think on LBC now, we're reaching a point where whenever anybody attempts to address the transgender issue, it's the same half a dozen people that are ringing in almost all the time. And, and yet, the newspapers continue. The newspapers continue to try to turn this into a huge wedge issue. In fact, 30p Lee spoke, didn't he? While he was still... I just need to check something with the producer. Do we know what party Lee Anderson is in this week? Is he... Are we... But he was definitely in the Tory party when he said they'd have to fight the next general election on, I think, culture wars and transgender toilets. Uh, so they know it. And so they're desperately, desperately, desperately trying to turn it into something which causes us all to hate each other's guts and to, and to fight furiously and to um, I, I continue, I, 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 as I say, biting chunks out of each other. And, and I don't. I don't want to really bite chunks out of anyone. But that's my second problem. My second problem is that I've probably offended everyone in that 20% of the population already. It's not even 20% of the population, is it? But I've probably offended everybody who cares passionately about this issue from one constituency or the other. I've probably offended them all already. I, I, I don't know why um, my support is so important to, to people, but I get the most bizarre and unpleasant messages from people heavily invested in this, either as a supporter of of trans rights or as a, 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 a denier of transgender rights. Um, incredibly personal uh, communications, but I think that's probably just a, the nature of the debate. So what do we know about Scotland's Hate Crime Act? We know that it will become a crime to deliberately misgender somebody, which means that if you were to call a transgender woman a man, then you would run the risk of being arrested. And what J.K. Rowling has done is call upon Police Scotland to arrest her. Um, she has listed 10 individuals, all of whom uh, identify or all of whom are transgender women, all of whom say they are transgender women, and she has described them all as men, adding the words, every last one of them. And... I look at the roll call of people that she has focused upon and struggle to muster up much sympathy for some of them on any front whatsoever. There is um, a rapist, for example, called Isla Bryson, a double rapist, no less, who transitioned or, or, or began to identify as female shortly before she was due to be sentenced. I, I find that hard to credit. Am I allowed to find that hard to credit? I, there is a, another um, a person here sent to a women's prison, a six foot five uh, a convict sent to a, a woman's prison, a biological male um, who had sexually assaulted a 10 year old girl in a women's public bathroom. There is a, another uh, transgender woman who was cleared of exposing her penis to two 11-year-old girls, but was later found to be in possession of 16,000 images of the vilest imaginable child sexual abuse. And, and it is this list of people that she, J.K. Rowling, has chosen. And, and then there are some, I, I, I think, um, 
people who I could feel a little bit aggrieved about being on a list of, of sex offenders. You have Munro Bergdorf, who is a, a model and public campaigner. Um, I, 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 I mean, she's here, uh, and yet J.K. Rowling insists this person is a man. And then you have uh, someone playing rugby, uh, who playing women's rugby who is is also a biological male and and I'm not I'm just struggling to what am I struggling to convey I'm struggling to to convey the problem here because the problem it seems to me is and always will be this I believe in fact I know because I've seen the evidence and some of it has been provided by JK Rowling that some men will pretend to be transgender women in order to avoid going to an all-male, well, going to a male prison. I, I think a couple of the people on this list probably fit into that category. But but I also believe that, that some people don't just think, but my opinion is they are or were born in the wrong body. So how can this law work? This is the question that I have for you. How, how can this law work? Because if you are a transgender woman, minding your own business, living a vulnerable life already, and what Hamza Youssef and the Scottish government have sought to do is to protect you from precisely the sort of behavior that Chrissy described so powerfully towards the end of the last hour. So Chrissy, from a completely different perspective, is describing how her physical appearance prompts people to be vile to her in public, to, to, to scream abuse at her, to, to treat her in a way that has caused her to be almost housebound, to, to find it very, very difficult to leave her house. So it is an attempt by the Scottish government to stop people from behaving similarly towards transgender women, uh, to a particularly... I suppose one has to say towards transgender women who are less likely to pass as women in a public space, to pass as biological women in a public space as, as others are. Um, and, and I can see sense in both of those positions. So JK Rowling should have the right, if she feels the need to do so, to call this particularly people involved in in crimes where their penis has been used she has the right to call them men because they are biological men but i also have some support or some sympathy for attempts to turn society into a safer place for transgender women so i i, I mean where do we go now on this who should be arrested You'd be arrested for shouting vile abuse at a transgender woman in public, for, for, for intimidating her, for frightening her. And the only reason why you're shouting abuse at her is because she is a transgender woman. That, that is why you are cross. That is why you are um, angry. That is why you are threatened or frightened or furious, whatever, whatever it may be, because there is a transgender woman who looks different from you or from what you're concept or your understanding of quotes normal end quotes might be therefore you will shout abuse at them i want you to be protected from that but and i think the case of isla bryson is possibly the best and I, and I know that i just said a moment ago you can't judge everybody on the uh palestinian peace marches according to the absolute scumbag who was carrying a swastika around and was quite rightly arrested although some people will be desperate to pretend that the uh, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people who weren't carrying a swastika are somehow represented by the one who was rather than the other way around um i i know I, I'd, I'd said that and and i don't believe that the problem that isla bryson and others represent is huge but neither do I believe it is non-existent. It, it is clearly true. There is something, I, I, I mean, dangerous, never mind ridiculous, about a biological man playing rugby with women. But I don't fully understand what it is that J.K. Rowling is trying to achieve. 
except to prove that people who are lying about being transgender are fair game for abusive and insulting language without explaining how we're going to protect people who are not lying. That's all. That's all. So let's try and have a conversation about this today that recognises the ability to hold two slightly contradictory thoughts in our heads at the same time. Another part of my problem with this is, is the fact that this list is so well rehearsed. You know, the, the examples that prove the danger or the examples that prove the problem are few and far between. But that doesn't mean the problem doesn't exist, either actually or potentially. It just means that attacking somebody because they are transgender seems to me something we should be discouraging, not encouraging. And calling a transgender woman a man seems to me to be a very deliberate attempt to upset them. And, and I don't understand why you need to deliberately attempt to upset people in order to prove your point about um, women's rights or safe spaces or, or, or whatever it may be. I, I mean, you know, a female prisoner or, or a rape survivor who's told that the person moving into the cell next door is a rapist with a penis. And that's, that's I'd have thought, a no-brainer for wrongness. And yet, what is achieved by objecting to a hate crime bill that would which would include that rapist on the list of people that you're not allowed to insult in this very specific way. You're not allowed to misgender. I suppose I'm wondering whether the price you pay for protecting thousands of people is affording too much kindness to people that don't deserve it, i.e. the liars and the rapists. So you're not allowed to misgender them either. Why is the freedom to misgender them so important to these people that's i think that's the bit i don't understand um hit the numbers now you will get through oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three and, and, and listen i'm on i don't know a great deal about it oddly I, I know roughly what i think but i'm constantly changing my mind about that the only thing i don't know I'd hand on heart is why it's such a big deal for people like jk rowling to 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 the point where she will run the risk of being arrested in order to say things that most people aren't going to have a problem with when she's talking about criminals, but some of us will be a little bit confused by when she's talking about innocent people, not non-criminals. Um, 23 minutes after 12 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien. It's, listen, it's a, it's a mad phone in. I, I, I don't really want to invite personal abuse again on this subject but compared to what a transgender woman is going to get in any conversation like this what i receive from people is 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 negligible and i think in the, the context of this it probably is important and, and if you know more about it than i do and if you're more clued up on what the hate uh what, what the bill in scotland is is likely to do the hate crime law is likely to do is designed to do is going to do then you know uh, the, the floor is yours oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three i just i just can't quite believe that jk rowling and 30p lee anderson have arrived at their conclusions for the same reason or indeed that the former is going to be entirely comfortable that she's ended up alongside the latter but hey what do i know it's 12 24. 26 minutes after 12. Rob, I, do, I don't think that reminding us that J.K. Rowling wrote um, the Cormoran Strike novels under the name Robert Galbraith is quite, is quite the zinger that, that you think it is. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a pseudonym. George Eliot um, was, was also a woman. The, 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 the parallel between that and somebody being transgender is, is, is non-existent, but you know, I, I, thanks for playing. I'm going to read you two texts that I don't think could do a better job of highlighting this issue, actually, and, and uh, happily why I find it almost impossible to navigate. Um, because the first one seems to me to be perfectly, uh, uh, utterly unprovocative and straightforward, and the second one seems to me to be deliberately quite unpleasant. But, I, I, you know, as I say, what do I know? So this texter has asked me not to use their name. I've been wanting to write you a letter for some time about the trans issue, in quotes, James. 
I appreciate it's a very sensitive issue, so I'm uncomfortable calling. Let's be honest, no one is likely to actually get arrested for transphobic comments. What this law does for me as a transgender woman and parent is tell me that there is a place in the world that believes I'm valid and should be able to live my life comfortably. I've never had a real issue with JK Rowling, except that she now seems to deal solely in trying to stir hatred. I didn't care about her opinion before, but it is constantly being thrust at me. I've had one issue in a toilet. Um, I was going into a men's toilet while passing as a woman. And so I usually try to use disabled toilets now to avoid upsetting anyone. On the issue of correctly gendering a convicted rapist, I don't know. Um, and I'd prefer you didn't use my name because I haven't told everyone yet that I am transitioning. So there is, I think, a, 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 a poignant and completely plausible contribution to the program. And here is in exactly the same minute, they both arrived at 12.24, misgendering is not real and is not a crime. Misgendering is a lie. Why is the truth important? Why is pandering to delusional people dangerous? Why is affirming people with mental illness dangerous? You are such a melt sometimes. And the problem I have here is I feel as if I'm being asked to pick between those two texters, one of whom sounds vulnerable and kind, one of whom sounds unhinged and unpleasant. But I'm sure that the unhinged and unpleasant texter doesn't speak for everybody on J.K. Rowling's side of this argument. And I'm sure that the, that the, the, the kindly texter doesn't speak for everybody on the other side. It's just this constant insistence that you're not allowed to be confused that can be so draining. Um, we'll start on your calls immediately after the very latest headlines with Amelia Cox. So some, some facts that help, perhaps, sex offenders, regardless of gender, will go into segregation in prison. I, I think they can refuse to. Um, I'm not entirely sure of the details. Um, but that perhaps is, 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 is unhelpful of me to talk about that because segregation sort of does exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, Rob goes further. According to the government's own figures, 268 prisoners identify as trans, which is just under half a percent of all prisoners, 90 percent of whom are in prison of their biological sex. So a tiny minority of a tiny minority um, somehow used to excuse vile hatred that puts trans people at increased risk. And, and again, to clarify on hatred, the, the law as I understand it in Scotland will be not that transgendering per se is illegal, because that of course would be impossible to police, but when it is done so to deliberately incite hatred, then it becomes potentially a police matter, which again seems very, very complicated, but leads back to this question of whether or not you allow a tiny amount of bad people, some of whom J.K. Rowling has named and, and listed on Twitter this weekend. Happy Easter, everybody. Whether or not you allow a tiny number of bad people to define how a much, much, much larger number of not bad people are treated or can be treated in public in our society. But I, hey, I'm probably missing something, and you will tell me what it is, I am sure. Dawn is in Biggin Hill. Dawn, what would you like to say? Hi, Jane. Hello. Um, my, my son is transgender. Um, he was born female. I'm sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> hey, take all the time you want. It's one of those days, Dawn. Seriously, pull up a chair, Dawn. Sit yourself down. What do you want? Two sugars? Oh, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> yes, please. Um, yeah, so he, he lives as male. Um, he used to be misgendered a lot before he had treatment. Right. Um, and he used to get very angry about it. And I used to try and explain to him that you know, people will often do it by mistake. You know, they, we, we are programmed to look at a person and decide whether they're male or female. We do it with babies. If they're in pink, we say, oh, it's a little girl. And if they're in blue, then yes. it's a little boy. We don't look at people neutral. We, we have this need to gender them. And that's, I think, where the problem comes. Um, with, the, with the prisons, I, I can't see any other thing apart from segregation. No. If you've got people that have committed sex crimes living as women and they've got a penis, then that you know that people are at risk. And equally, so where, where does where does the leap come from then? That because those people exist, we we and I use the word loosely should be free yeah. to be vile about your son. Am I seeing that correctly? Is that what the argument I, is here? I, I mean, how would you police it? You, 
the police can't cope with that sort of thing. You know, it happens. Well, you can. All the time. You can. I mean, if you. I mean, certainly homophobic hate crimes, race, racist hate crimes can. Be, I mean, protected characteristics. So transgenderism becomes a protected characteristic, yeah. in a way yeah. that biological sex is not. So it's it's not in any mm. conflict with. How do you respond to this? You, so misgendering is a lie. Misgendering is not real and is not a crime. But so the way that that works is that there is no such thing as transgender and as the mother of a transgender man. How, how, how do you even begin to address that claim, that, that argument, which is not, you know, unique. It's not that rare. Well, you know, as a parent, it was very difficult. When, when it all started, because, you know, I had a daughter and now I've got a son. So yes. that was that was a massive thing to get my head around. Um, I, it's difficult because, you know, he did get sort of a bit of trouble before. And yeah. he had even um, had a manager at one of his jobs that made um, a transgender phobic comment. Right. And, um, it, and it went very, very high in the company and, and the manager was moved on. So... You know, I think people are dealing with it as and when they can. Whether it should be a crime, hmm, I don't know. What what would be the penalty for it? I don't, I don't know, but you've described it being policed, albeit only in the context of work. Can I ask a couple yeah. of questions that may illustrate my ignorance, but I'd be able to benefit <laughs> from your deeper experience? Sure. Sure. Did you did you believe him from the start? No. Go on, tell me about that, that journey. No, he he was quite, well, he was always a bit of a tomboy. Yeah. And uh, I remember when he was about, maybe about 10, and he went for a haircut, because he'd, he'd had long hair and it was always a bird's nest, he didn't do anything with it. And <laughs> we would cut it into a girly haircut, and he came home and he said to me, I don't want this haircut, right. I want a boy's haircut. So we had to go back to the hairdressers and get his haircut as a boy. And that's where it first started. And he more and more would dress as a boy and then started to talk to me about the fact that he didn't feel like he was female okay. and he hated his body, absolutely hated it. And still does now because he's, he's waiting for some surgery. Right. Um, and, and that's hard, you know, transgender Very. people don't make that decision easily. Well, that's another because- thing I've always found confusing about, you know, the idea that... It, well, I suppose it depends how far you go down that road. Once you're heading towards mm-hmm. surgery, it's 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 such a serious thing to be doing. I, that I just you... think they're so brave, James. They're so brave to to you know to to live as they want to be. Why can't we leave them alone? Okay, well, it's harder question. for a man to transgender because quite often they have the build of a man and and they're, they're easily yes. recognised. And I find that sad. But you know, if I wanted to live as a lollipop. It's no one else's business but mine. So I walk around. Well, uh, un- until out. until people start complaining that you're expecting to hang out in, I'm, this is going to sound stupid, but it's your fault. You brought lollipops into it. Until <laughs> until you start insisting that you get to hang out in places that have previously been reserved for people that were born lollipops. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and I understand that, that. and, and I, I believe a lot of it is sincere and authentic. It's, it's because yeah. men men will lie to gain access to these spaces by pretending to be women, and therefore to keep women spe- safe, you have to deny access to these spaces to all. Yeah, and I, and I can't imagine how you would deal with that. Because... Well, you can't. That's when you have to have oh, the no. underpant police. And my second yeah. silly question. All right, or well, not mm. silly, but but possibly a bit crass from your side of this discussion, is when did you reach the point of no return? When did you just accept or realise that you have a son and you no longer have a daughter? When did that happen? It was very slow. Yes, I'm sure. Um, When he started having uh, testosterone treatment and so his his facial hair came in and what have you. But the thing is, as a parent, I don't look at him and think... He's a boy or a girl. I look at him and I see my child who I love. You know, I think this is where people get absolutely obsessed with gender. I don't care what gender he is. He's my son and I love him. And if if people have got a problem with the notion of transition, then we would just rely on pronouns. But people have got a massive problem with pronouns as well. It does. It does. I, I don't know. Thank you, Dawn. And lucky. I sound like Yoda now. I was about to say, lucky is he to have a mother like you, but but he clearly is because there'll be plenty of transgender people 
listening to this who, who would dream of having a supportive and understanding parent. Thank you. From Dawn to Daniela, who's in Manchester. Daniela, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, um, I am a transgender woman myself. And unfortunately, I am the Karen fodder yes. at the moment. What does that mean? This. Tell me what that means. How is your life changing? Well, I was the victim of a hate crime last year, which destroyed my mental health, unfortunately. Um, I was honoured to be able to give evidence to the UN last year as well Gosh. Um, about how bad things are getting. And it really is getting bad at that. I mean, I have what's called passing privilege. Um, right. For the most part, people don't know when they look at me. I've been medically transitioning. I've been on hormones now for yeah. five, six years. I haven't heard and that And I walk before. down the street yeah. without makeup, Nobody bats an eyelid because, for the most part, people are that wrapped up in their own little world. Nobody really cares. Yeah, is the honest thing. Mostly, nobody cares, but they're making this an issue. Well, um, let, let me ask you then: in 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 your oh. words, and uh, yes. to, if you were to be as as kind and as accommodating as you could possibly be, and it's a bit unfair of me to ask you to do that when you don't necessarily receive that reciprocally but but if if i were to say to you what is the problem here that that people like jk rowling have and in a genuine and authentic sense how would you describe her problem it's with, the with, same problem as homosexuals had in the 80s i don't I, we're I mean, different we're new we're different and because of that people freak if you have a look at some of the rhetoric that's being used um it's exactly the same as what was used against the gays in the eighties. Well, they would they would not agree with that though. So again, and, and I'll push you a little further. What would they say okay. their, their their issue was with you? Not not what you think it is, but what would they say? What do you think they would say it was? Because they wouldn't say we're just the latter day equivalent of of, of ignorant homophobes, would oh, they? They they, they, would, uh, they So what would they say? They basically, the arguments that I get, um, I mean, I've been quite lucky that I've not had much. Um, it's more that they don't believe it. Right. I mean, scientifically speaking, transgenderism behaviour has been seen across 20 different species in the animal kingdom. Yeah. Um, but transphobia has only been seen in one, which is crazy. The majority of the biologists who, who study this, the the majority of no again the I, 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 I I'm sorry to I, I, and I am familiar with this but it's not what I was asking you and, and that's fine you okay. don't because what I asked you was po probably impossible to ask but let me read you what what J.K. Rowling says it is impossible come on I, I, well no I'm just checking that I've got the right quote actually well it, this is either her or someone speaking in support of her it is impossible to accurately describe or tackle the react re, the reality of violence and sexual violence committed against women and girls or address the current assault on women's and girls' rights unless we are allowed to call a man a man. That, that's their argument. Okay. Um, my opinion on that, to be truthful... Yeah. My opinion on that is kind of like twofold. Go on. Um, that is J.K. It, Rowling. I've just checked. I just, I just, I'd cut the newspaper oh, article out, and I only had halfway yeah, through the fine. quote. So I, I, just I, me being very analog, Daniel. I, yes. I, I tend to ignore everything she says because it's so hateful. Well, you can't. Like, you've phoned a phone, and you've rung into a phone, and spawned in part by her contribution <laughs> to this conversation. So, so that bit there, oh, where, where she yeah. says you cannot address or describe the reality of violence and sexual violence committed against women and girls unless you are allowed to call a man a man. And, uh, and the bit I don't get, and probably you don't either, is the bit where the, 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 the people she's talking about who seem to me to be fair game for that criticism, you know, the, 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 the rapist who used a penis to rape a woman, I, I, being the freedom oh, to, yeah, call, I mean, to call that man a man now. seems to me to be fine, but she seems to also want to be able to call you a man, and that's the bit I don't get. That's exactly. That. It's like calling, as a, as a very, very extreme example. Yes. And a, and a very, very extreme example. Let's say that it's like saying all Russians are Ukraine-hating murderous buggers. 
they're painting bad apples. Or all, to all Palestinian, everybody. all all Palestinian peace marchers are Hamas I, supporters. I or, or, didn't or, want to. No, say well, why that, not? In for a penny, yeah. in for a pound, um, Daniela. We're not right. treading on eggshells today. Well. Yeah, except that those are uh, those are, are opinions and 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 ideas and thoughts rather than actions and and physical realities or otherwise. I don't know. Thank you. 12.45 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. A few more of your calls after this. It is 12.48 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. And, and, and that is, I think, where I am on this. It's, it's conflation, isn't it? A tiny number of, of people who've done despicable things being used to justify, at worst, hatred of, incitement to hatred of, or, or um, at least meanness towards people who haven't done anything wrong. Unless, of course, and I think this is part of the problem, unless, of course, you think that being transgender involves, or claiming to be transgender, which is presumably the language you would use, uh, involves doing something wrong. Uh, Joshua puts it like this. The problem is that she's deliberately equating a small problem um, perpetrated by a minority with um, with a whole, with the whole of a population, much like the government do with immigrants or protesters. And that's another reason, perhaps, why this is such a strange subject in, and, and, and why J.K. Rowling's involvement in it is so strange. To me, who's merely tried and failed to fully understand it, is because, you know, in a conversation about the demonization of an entire population because of the malfeasance of a small minority of people who claim to be part of that population should usually be on the other side you know she doesn't demonize her all the people that line up alongside her many of the people who line up alongside her are passionate in their hatred of all sorts of minorities uh, it, it's a little bit like people who hate muslims claiming to love israel you know and look at the damage that's done to israel um allowing people like that to, to to speak for you or to represent western thought the people whose real interest really was just an entire should we talk about enthusiasm almost for watching palestinian civilians get killed there was no particular interest or commitment to israel involved in this but then you know you come to this one and you think well look the, 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 these are some people who seem to me to deserve sympathy and support and yet you're saying that that should be diluted or taken away because of the existence of some scumbags who claim to be in the same category as the people who deserve sympathy and support. And then she spends Easter weekend, or indeed Trans Visibility Day, listing the scumbags um, as proof that we should be free to be vile to every. I don't know. Maybe, as I say, I'm probably missing something. CJ's in Redditch. CJ, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, I, I think uh, actually you you articulated quite well where I was going to come from on this uh, oh. just in the last couple of minutes in that I think it is conflating the the actions of a few and tiny minority edge case issues. And yeah, but here's my the problem act. then, and I know I'm interrupting and I've talked too much Sorry. already, but my problem then is that she's a genius. She can't be. She she she's you know she's brilliant in so many ways that she can't be falling into such an obvious trap as the one you describe. So so look, I, I I'm a you know was a ma am, Go on. was a massive fan of her work. Okay, um, huge Harry Potter fan. Uh, really appreciated the casual vacancy the book she wrote. After that, yeah. well, that was really interesting discussion of class issues. I think she has unfortunately just followed a path that a few others have on social media where they double down to the point that they can no longer see the surface mm. of where they started. And I, I, I you know, if you, if you track back her Twitter account, and, and I have an opinion that part of the reason that this is so problematic is it, it is happening on Twitter, almost entirely on Twitter. Um, well, that's, her, I, you know, I was just talking to the her. producer about that. I, I mean, we've got it right today in terms of it getting calls from people who we haven't necessarily heard from before and who have interesting things to say, but 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 it doesn't bite like other subjects bite generally, unless you go down the route of inviting people to come on the radio and just say relatively disgusting things. And it, it, it seems to me that the law in Scotland is just designed to diminish the freedom people have to say gratuitously disgusting things based on transgender. 
identity as opposed to because no one's got a problem with homosexuality or race now being issues that you cannot incite hatred over so why have a problem with this one yeah, no, I, I, agree, I agree with you. I think that is the point behind the law. And, you know, there are politicians who are desperate to pull this off Twitter and make it part of the public discourse. As mm. you say, I don't think that's working, except in small sub- subsets. But I, I think, yes, is she very intelligent and a very talented writer? Yes, of course she is. However, that doesn't that intelligence sadly doesn't stop any of us. Maybe, well, being I, pulled I, no, you're you're the, quite right. Maybe my admiration of her is so great that I, 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 I'm less clear-eyed about it than you are, but I still don't think so, CJ. I read you this from Lee. I don't believe that she's equating the whole population to a few criminals or, or conflating. She's highlighting them as the reasons why we should not create blanket laws on delicate situations that will protect them. She's engaged in narrative busting, and in this case, the narrative seeks to ignore the danger and therefore push through vague laws. She is highlighting some genuine counter-arguments. That's a more helpful analysis of, of what, what J.K. Rowling and others think than perhaps you allow. Potentially. However, I, I, I try to stay off Twitter as much as possible these days. Very but wise. But when I do, you know, if I, if I do track back, there is no, she is now has this tendency of going after. Uh, yeah, but you can't. You can't do. You've said that already. I'm looking at what what Lee said then, which is about using these extreme examples as almost test cases for why the law can't be as as vague or as as in in um, unspecific as critics of the law in Scotland would say that it is, because by protecting those people over there who deserve protection, you are also protecting these people over here who don't. And, and that perhaps is, is where it ends, CJ. Some people think that is the price you pay. And I don't think men are qualified to make that judgment, really, because it's not me that would be on the receiving end of, of what might happen as a consequence of, of letting those people over there benefit from the protections we've afforded to those people over there. Do you see what I mean? No, I do. And I, and I think there is the problem with this discussion is so I, I'm non-binary um, okay. people. You, you may infer from my voice, you know, gender assigned at birth and all that. But yes. but, but, I, but I am non-binary and have identified as such for quite a few years. Um, but I think there is a problem with this debate where you elements of misogyny can creep in yeah. uh, when it's discussed, often discussed not by trans people. But well, by, you're telling me that's the maddest thing about it but by other people, yeah, and I've absolutely seen that. Um, but I don't think that just because that is the case, the opposite immediately becomes true, and therefore... And, and we don't make hate speech laws, and we don't make protection laws based on this tiny minority of a minority could cause problems. Uh, no, or well, there's, there's, there's problems, another tension. No, and our problems, and, and that there is another tension. So either you, you, you see it one way, in which case you say, well, no, those are precisely the reasons why we shouldn't have laws that protect the massive majority because this tiny minority exists, or, or you, you, you do it the other way around and, and say that those are the reasons why we absolutely shouldn't have laws because they would end up protecting the tiny minority. And I think, oddly, that's probably the closest I've come to understanding why I find it so confusing and, 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 and conflicting. So it's just a question of what you care most about. But ne- neither side is ever going to have the full weight of intellectual support on their side, I don't think. Maybe. I'd, CJ, thank you. Um, the, the, I need to tell you that the, the, the name comes up now if you text on whatsapp so when you write strong women jk rowling speaks for all of us strong women the fact that your name comes up as mick
kind of proves CJ's point about this conversation often being conducted by people who are not being entirely honest about their motivations. I'll tell you what, though, just by way of light relief, how about a little bit of this? Woke watch. Scones or scones. There's a con. You think this is a controversial conversation. You think the Middle East is controversial. Wait till you start talking about scones. Um, the Daily Telegraph or the Daily Mail, one or the other, reported this weekend that the uh, the growing wokeness at the National Trust had reached critical mass because they now have woke scones. What is a woke scone? I hear you ask. Answer, it involves a vegan recipe. They even got MPs to get involved. Bill Cash said, it makes me wonder what will happen next. Will they stop selling Madeira cake because of historical events in Madeira? And the same woman, a 64-year-old from Bury St. Edmunds, is quoted in every article saying, I can't stand the taste of the new scones. They're not like traditional ones at all. They are flatter, drier and have an unappealing texture. Unfortunately for everybody involved in this particular skirmish of the culture wars, it turns out that the National Trust have been making their scones to this vegan recipe for years. It's just that over the Easter weekend, the Daily Mail noticed. Woke what? And that is almost it from me for today. What a lot of ground we've covered. Um, thank you. A lot of love coming in for Seamus and Chrissy for reasons that everybody who caught those calls will fully understand. And, and, you know, it's not just a radio show where we reach the end and forget all about each other and forget about what's happened. I'll be thinking about both of you moving forward. Um, and, and I do hope that you can find some help and support, particularly Chrissy, because Seamus is already on that path that you so obviously deserve, I'm going to say, Chrissy. I'm not going to say need. I'm going to say deserve. You deserve some help, not least because you got so little growing up from the places where most of us would have expected to find it. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. 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 Now it's time for Sheila Fogarty.